Good morning, uh, staff, staff. <laughs> <laughs> commissioners. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to the June 27th Planning Commission meeting for Placer County. And if you would all rise and join me with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible. Ms. Hectorate, if you will proceed with the roll call. Mr. Uh, Mr. Nader? Here. Mr. Moss? Here. Mr. Johnson? Here. Mr. Ricucci? Here. Mr. Denio? Here. Mr. Sevison? Here. Mr. Gray? Here. Given enough time, um, Mr. Thompson will address us. I think he's gone to the bathroom. Good morning. Um, as far as past, nothing to report on past board meetings. Um, on July 25th, the board will meet up uh, in Tahoe at the resort of Squaw Creek, and they will hear the appeal on the Forest Flyer project, as, all, uh, as well as receive an update from um, our office on the Tahoe Basin Community Plans. Uh, for upcoming Planning Commission meetings on July 11th, uh, we had originally anticipated going to Tahoe, but we're going to change that plan. And the reason is the workshop that we're going to have, that we were planning on having on the Tahoe Basin Community Plan, wasn't really ready for prime time, and, and we, we, we're going to need to reschedule that uh, pro possibly for later September. Uh, but we will be uh, meeting on, on uh, um, the 11th, and the Planning Commission will consider. Uh, the North Star Highlands 2 project, uh, and that's a modification to the existing use permit, as well as the CUP for the Martis Valley Trail segment, and that's phase, phase one of that trail segment. And in front of you is either a CD or a paper copy on the final EIR for that project, so you can start looking at that. Um, now, as far as the July 25th meeting, that's uh, looking to be a ra rather busy schedule. Um, there we're looking at um, an item, uh, a subdivision modification for the Rancho Del Oro project. That's a project that's in Granite Bay, and they're running into some drainage issues, and, and they're, gonna, they're proposing to do some additional contour grading on some of the lots in, in the subdivision, as well as uh, looking at reducing the right-of-way widths uh, on the roads within the subdivision. Also a, a subdivision modification for a setback on a property in Alpine Meadows area. Uh, a temporary use permit for the community resources, uh, recovery resources, that's a uh, overnight drug rehabilitation center that's proposed in off of Shale Ridge in the Auburn area. Uh, a request for the Planning Commission to make a recommendation to the board on the housing element. And that's moving forward. We've got uh, just minor, minor comments from HCD. So we're looking to get that move forward to the Board of Supervisors after uh, uh, your commission considers uh, a recommendation on that. And lastly, another workshop uh, uh, addressing the zoning tax amendment for uh, the winery ordinance updates. So could be a rather full agenda on the 25th. Any questions? So the early July meeting is up at the lake and the late July meeting is down here. The no July meet, uh, no, lake. no lake, no meeting up at the lake in July. Okay. Oh, the 11th isn't at the lake. No, it'll be, it'll be down here. It's scheduled down here now. The board will be meet, meeting up in uh, at the lake, at the resort at Squaw Creek on July 23rd. Oh. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Paul. Okay. All right. Next. In case anybody of the public has any comments concerning anything that's not on the agenda today, this would be the time to come forward. Seeing no one jump out of their seats. We'll have our first and only item of business, the workshop on the community centers.
and <coughs> the Rosako will address us now. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Gray. As you stated, this is the second workshop on um, a proposed zoning text amendment to community centers in the Plus County Zoning Ordinance. By way of background, um, we held the first uh, workshop on community centers on May 9th of this year. Um, 30 members of the public attended, 12 of those gave public comment. The things that staff heard during that, during that period and, and, and the general direction was, uh, that was given to us from you was the definition of community center was too broad and needed to be more specific. Um, specific standards uh, should be looked at to be placed on community centers and event type centers um, that must be met before they're approved. Um, there was also a discussion about uh, the Rural Lincoln MAC um, sent a letter to the Board of Supervisors which had a whole list of things um, that they were concerned about with regard to community centers. You also asked that we take a look at that. The um, other primary concern that came up that uh, was discussed at the first uh, workshop was you were also very concerned about um, making sure that when event centers and community centers went forward that there was appropriate code enforcement uh, ability to deal with violations that they might um, that might come about and that we come up with some solutions to deal with that in a much, uh, much more expedient way than we have been in the past. So with that, I think what I'll do is I will just move on to the discussion of the issues. And, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over specifically the things that staff has come up with and recommendations and then in some instances talk about what other communities might do with regard to all the issues that I think implement the three general things that I just talked about. So basically the first one is the definition of community center. As you know, um, the community center's definition at this time is exceedingly broad. It basically um, states that uh, anywhere there's a social gathering of people, it's considered a community center and it needs a use permit. And it goes across a huge range of our zone districts because of its broad nature. After some research, what staff um, proposed was that we come up with two more distinct uh, definitions for what would be a community center today. One would actually still be called a community center. And that community center would be um, an actual center which is for public or private, uh, excuse me, which is on public or private property and that functions primarily to provide a, community, uh, excuse me, a community-centered meeting hall for members of the public to carry out community-oriented activities, public and civic functions. Examples of that would be uh, Grange Halls, Veterans Halls, Portuguese Hall in Newcastle, Dutch Flat Community Center. There's another one in Christian Valley called the Eden Valley Improvement <coughs> Club, which was truly a community center. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that these might not have private events like weddings and things like that, but that's not their primary function. And I think if you're familiar with Grange Halls and that sort of thing, that you drive by them all the time and there's not a party going on that often. I mean, occasionally, but it's not their primary function. The next definition that we uh, moved to was event centers. And basically, this is uh, a place on private property that is available to anyone for social gatherings. Um, there's no uh, requirement that uh, it have any public or civic community, community needs. Based. It's simply a place that you go, you have weddings, you have parties, or any other event that you would like. Okay. With regard to how other counties have handled this, um, Santa Barbara is really the only county that has gone through and, and really redefine these things and they've come up and it's in the staff report and I won't go over it. They've come up with three distinct definitions for these types of uses. Amador and Sonoma County really haven't even bothered to define these. Um, so with regard to that, the next um, uh, issue that came up is if you were to redefine community centers and event centers in some fashion, the way I just described, it may not be exactly that way, but if you break it into more definitive um, definitions, the thing to consider is an actually community-based community center um, 
it's likely that you might not want to change anything with the way um, we handle it. They would all need use permits. They would all be in a broad range of, uh, it would be in a broad range of zone districts um, because they are truly, truly community-based. They need to be tailored <coughs> to the specific community or use for it. And the best way to handle that would be through um, looking at them on an individual case-by-case -case basis and having a, a use permit involved. I will tell you in, in, in the last 10 or 15 or 20 years that I can think of, no new community center as defined in this staff report has come forward. They're a relatively rare occurrence. We have what I think is probably most of the ones that we are going to have. There might be a few, um, like a private community center in a subdivision or something that's for the benefit of those uh, residents. There might be a few like that, but I don't think you're going to see a Grange Hall, new Veterans Hall. I don't think you're going to see anything like that in the future. So then you move on to event centers. <clears throat> and this is really the new definition that brought all this to the forefront. Now this is just a private <clears throat> place for people to gather and have social gathering. So what I went through, and I, I went through and I looked at the appropriate zone districts um, where you might be able to do an event center. And the first ones that come to mind are simply our commercial zone districts. Completely appropriate, set up to handle this kind of use. You do it with zoning clearance. The next would be, we have a couple of commercial zone districts, commercial plan development and OP. A little bit different, still require a use permit for an event center and those things based on their, their specialty nature. Where it really, where the conversation really begins to get interesting is when you have an event center in, uh, oh, sorry, I skipped over one, and also residential single family and residential multifamily. Um, probably not somewhere where we would like to have an event center of this nature. There are some event type uses in other counties in residential single family neighborhoods. They are usually associated with a very limited and defined amount of events that a bed and breakfast could have, small weddings, that sort of thing. But as far as just an event center, um, most jurisdictions do not allow it in residential single family or residential multifamily. What I alluded to earlier is where, where it really becomes interesting is when you get into the residential ag, residential forestry, and farm zones. That's really where most of our conversation has, has been centered. What, um, what's appropriate with regard to an event center in those zone districts? I can tell you in the counties that we've looked at so far, Amador uh, County, Sonoma County, and Santa Barbara County, they simply don't allow an event center type use in their agricultural districts unless it is attached to an agricultural use, generally a winery. Um, so with that, what we did is, what I'm going to discuss now is all what we see as the pertinent issues that uh, speak to what we talked about last time. The first one would be, so if you want to consider an event center in those three agricultural zone districts, what would be a minimum parcel size? Do you want to institute a minimum parcel size for an event center type use in conjunction with a winery or some or or not a winery because now they would be able to just be a standalone event center. Um, Amador County, an event center has to be attached to a winery, and you need 40 acres or larger. Santa Barbara County has to be attached to a winery, you need 20 acres or larger. Uh, Sonoma County does not have a size requirement. However, they handle all of their uh, event centers attached to wineries or other agricultural uses through a use permit, and they take a very hard look at all the factors surrounding it, and that's the way that they decide whether it's appropriate or not. So that's one thing that we need to, to, to look at today. Um, the next issue that came up was um, setbacks and limiting the size of structures with regard to event centers. Uh, in the agricultural zone districts. Um, when staff did research, one of the things that they found was a common occurrence with other ordinances that, that uh, deal with event centers in agricultural areas. There was no 
no size limitations placed on buildings in conjunction with the event center. But what did happen is they did, uh, they used much larger setbacks than normal from surrounding properties. Um, for instance, in Santa Barbara County, you have to have a 200 foot setback from your property line for any of the event center uses. So when you push something 200 feet back from the exterior property line, the size of buildings issue sort of diminishes because that's a large buffer, your perspective changes, and it has the, uh, it has the effect of reducing noise and the visual impact from an event center. So that's, that's one of the ways they got around it. But you could certainly limit the size of building, buildings or you could institute setbacks. The next issue that came up is um, events in the rural area. <clears throat> you could um, limit the uh, attendance at these events in rural areas. I can tell you that in Amador County, they allow wineries on 40 acres to have unlimited amounts of events up to 125 people. They allow 12 events of up to 450 people with no more than four of those events um, in any one month before you need a use permit. Santa Barbara County um, does not have a limit on the amount of attendees. Um, oh, excuse me, they do. They uh, limit it to 200 people um, before you need a use permit. So that's another thing you might wanna think about. Another issue when you look at events in this area is do you have an appropriate number? Um, there's all sorts of ways you could, you could come to that conclusion. You could sit down and you could look at a typical five acre parcel put in the parking, look at the event area that would be involved, and, and come to a conclusion about what might be appropriate amount of people there. Um, the next question becomes, uh, should there be a maximum number of events for uh, event centers in the agricultural zone districts? Um, I've alluded to this previously. Um, it's unlimited Amador County. Santa Barbara County allows 20. Um, Sonoma County has no limit with regard to uh, the number of events. Again, they handle everything specifically through a use permit process. They look at where is it at, what kind of carrying capacity it has, that sort of thing. So that's another thing you would definitely like to look at. Uh, the next issue is uh, hours of operation. Do you want to have set hours of operation? Um, it seems to be... Uh, the time that comes up the most often when I look, or excuse me, when uh, staff looks at other ordinances is 10 p.m. at night tends to be a common cutoff time for events in, in agricultural areas. I did find earlier cutoff times depending on what was going on. Some of, uh, some of the regulations talk about 7 p.m. being a cutoff time for amplified music and then an event can continue on until 10 p.m. So there's all sorts of options with regard to that. Um, one of the things that, that comes up, and it, this dovetails into the next issue, is noise issues. The thing about, about nighttime and events is that people's perceptions of noise and disturbance go up greatly in the evening. Um, people are usually settling down for the evening. A lot of the background noise that goes on during the day, traffic, washing machines, dishwashers, people moving around tends to disappear. So if you have 65 decibels coming towards your property during the day, it's much less perceptible than if you're sitting on your deck at 7.30 or 8 at night and there's a party next door and that, that sound is coming towards you. So that's another thing to think about when you um, start uh, talking about hours of operation, um, which dovetails Next, into the noise issue, you may wish to uh, think about special noise considerations with um, regard to community, or excuse me, event centers in um, rural uh, areas. Sonoma County, again, just handles it through a use permit. Santa Barbara County is fairly consistent with the noise ordinance that we have in place today. They require event, cent event center type uses in agricultural districts not to exceed 65 decibels at their um, property line. 
It's not exactly the same standard that we have with regard to our noise ordinance, but very close. Amador County has no requirement with regard to noise. Um, however, there are all sorts of uh, options if you wanted to discuss how to limit noise, what to do with noise. Um, it's a highly subjective thing, noise. Some people are not noise sensitive at all. Other people are extremely noise sensitive. So when you start looking at options, um, it really does become sort of a, a subjective call. Is it appropriate for them to have a certain amount of noise leaving sight that the neighbors hear? Do you wanna stop that? I mean, you could require events in uh, the agricultural areas that have events with amplified music that they're inside and that there's a certain amount of decibels that can't be created more than 15 feet away from that building. So there's all sorts of options to deal with it. It's just a matter of, of sort of coming to a, a decision about how we should go about that. The next issue um, was access issues. So another one of the, the issues with regard to event type centers in the uh, rural areas is the use of private roads. Um, two of the counties, Santa Barbara and Amador County, have, have dealt with this in, this in in essentially saying, if you're on a private road, you need to enter into an agreement with everyone who has the rights on that private road. And uh, if you can't enter into an agreement with them to use that road for your, for your event center use, then you need to get a use permit and the county will look at that in the context of what we need to require to make that road safe for everyone on it. Um, the other thing you could do is require that uh, um, event centers in rural areas gain ingress and egress from, from publicly maintained rights of way. That's another option. Uh, and feel free, I know I, I'm hitting you with a lot of information, so if you'd like to ask me any questions, feel free. Okay, none so far. The other, the other option. You didn't pause yet, I'm gonna wait for you to pause. Oh. You haven't paused yet. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm pausing, does anyone have anything? Okay. So the next issue that came up was, uh, if you have an event center type use in an agricultural area, would uh, or should there be a requirement that that event center be subordinate and in support of an agricultural use on site? Um, again, there are ways that we could do that. You could simply put standards in place that say, if you're gonna have an event center in a, uh, an agricultural zone district, you need to meet the following standards. One of the standards that I put out was that uh, if you wanted to do that, you could require that they meet the same standards that they would have to meet to go into a William Center contract, which is essentially you have to show that you're producing $4,500 worth of agricultural product a year and that you can continue to do so into the future. That would just be one potential. May or may not choose to do that. The next uh, one that came up was actually one of the ones that was uh, from the Lincoln Mac, and that was about on-site security. They wanted the issue of uh, security addressed in the sense if, if someone is serving alcohol on-site, should there be a need for on-site security? Um, that would be something that we would ask direction on. Um, the other issue um, is lighting. If you're gonna allow a, a, an event center in a, in a in an agricultural district, do you want to place special lighting standards? That's another issue um, that uh, people are concerned about. They don't want high intensity metal highlight lights 35 feet in the air. Um, there are things that you could do there. You could make all the lighting uh, with regard to event centers in, in an agricultural area be dark sky compliant. You could have high limits. You could have full cutoff lights. There's a lot of issues there. The next issue that uh, came up was food guidelines with regards to uh, an event center in the agricultural area. Um, do you wanna require them to serve prepackaged food? Do you wanna require that they only be allowed to have catering companies come out and cater? Um, are you okay with 
uh, them having commercial kitchens where they can have full-on events and, and feed people just like, uh, per se, a restaurant would be of the same standard. So that's something to think about. Um, the next issue that has been talked about is an event center density um, intensity issue. Uh, you may wish to consider that you can't have an event center um, within a certain distance of another event center. Um, I cannot find in any of my research anywhere that has, has that kind of requirement, that there's a half mile radius or a four quarter mile radius from event center to event center. The other issue that has come up is with regard to noticing requirements. There has been some discussion about uh, whether it would be appropriate to expand the 300 uh, foot mail out notice requirement. Um, you could do that. Uh, the question that comes if you want to expand the distance is how far do you expand it? Do you go 600 feet? Do you go 900 feet? Do you, if let's say, for instance, uh, there's a winery, a new winery on Mount Vernon Road, and they're going to have events, would you maybe consider noticing everyone on Mount Vernon Road um, that would be affected by them going up and down their road out to, let's say, Highway 49? So there's all sorts of issues with regard to expansion of a noticing um, area. Then we're pretty close to the last issue. West Community Centers and Event Center code enforcement options. What we were able to um, come up with at this point is uh, have the Sheriff's Department personnel should be on call 24 hours a day to respond to community center and event center complaints. Generally, the complaints that happen are to do with noise. Plush County Noise Ordinance at this time requires that the sheriff be the first responder. Um, within the same breath, though, that we would also have to um, probably meet with the Sheriff's Department personnel and, and have sort of a little seminar with them about what the, what the expectations are how they measure the sound, make sure they have the appropriate equipment, that sort of thing. The other thing we can do is we can streamline the violation process um, by eliminating some of the steps and uh, moving much more quickly through the violation process. Um, the other option available to us is if you have violations of their conditions of approval or zoning violations with regard to community and event centers, we have the option of citing them and not pursuing it as an infraction, but we could pursue it as a misdemeanor through the district attorney's uh, office if he chooses to pursue it. It's up to him whether he does or not. Then there's one other option that is really sort of a proactive option, and it's one that Sonoma County institutes, and that is that all event center type uses be given a two-year probationary period of operation which means that if you get an event center, let's say in a rural area, that you would have a two-year period to show that you meet all your requirements and that you don't exceed any of the limitations that are placed upon you. And if you do do that, then there are certain ways you could be probably come back to the Planning Commission, staff would put you back before the Planning Commission, and you revoke the use permit based on the understanding as you were in a probationary period, it did not work. There might be other ways to handle that without coming back to a public hearing, but it would be some version of that. The last thing that I wanted to talk about was, as we've been going through this and it's the community center and the, and the winery ordinance are starting to, to cross a little bit, one of the things that's become um, apparent to staff is that we have large areas of fragmented ag lands. And, and the reason I'm bringing this up at the end is because when you think about all these things, you also have to think about the face of Placer County. And I, and I brought some slides to illustrate it. This is essentially what we have today on the left. And the slides get better. This is a little difficult to follow. And then on the right, what we will have at uh, the possible future build out. 
So all the brown is 40 acre parcels or larger. And then as it gets lighter, you go to 10, and then one to 10. Then when you get to white, it's less than one acre. So you can see over time that you're definitely moving towards a lot more one to 10 acre pieces and a lot less large acreage. And let me move forward here to give you, this is some historical perspective. This is the Brennan's Road area down by King Road and Auburn Folsom in 1938 on the right. You can see that the topography has, has greatly changed. You have basically in this entire area, which is not quite a square mile, you have one dwelling unit. Then you go over to 2011 and in the same area you have 20. Again, this is a, a further out view of where Brennan's Road is and King Road and that sort of thing. And in that entire area, you have five to, se five to seven dwelling units. And then um, in 2011, you have 100 plus. And this is, this is the most telling slide. This is the Gold Hill Road area, if you're familiar with that area at all. This is the intersection where you turn left to go down Virginia Town, and if you go up, you can go right on Chili Hill. Uh, NID has a corporation yard right where Virginia Town dovetails into Gold Hill. So this is what, an, what a residential ag 4.6 area looks like today. This is fairly typical. You have, you have here, you have a 15 acre piece, then you have a two acre piece, a one acre piece, a three point acre piece, a little piece here that's not even probably half an acre, 4.6 an acre. You can see they're scattered. So when you go through and you look at all this, the context that you have to remember is that even though you can have a winery on this 15 acre piece, you're surrounded by a lot of small pieces. And the next, and the next slide, so this piece is north of the piece we just looked at. The south line of this piece is exactly sitting on top of the other piece. So what you see is now this zoning has gone up to 10 acre minimum. Is that right? Um, that might not be right. Let me flip to another slide really quickly. Yes. This piece that you see is on FBX 10, farm 10 acre minimum. The piece below it is RA 4.6. So what you see is you have large pieces. Oops, I'm sorry, I hit the wrong button. Apologize. What you have is you have large pieces. You have here, you have a 27 acre piece, you have a 25 acre piece, and then you get into um, mostly fours to five acre pieces over here. But the thing is, again, you're like, well, yeah, no, you could have a pretty decent winery on these, 25, 27, 11. The thing to keep in mind is when we go back, that 25 acre piece, these are the pieces that are contiguous to it. A five, a three, a two, a two, a one, a one, a one, fives. So this is a typical scenario in the county, especially in the areas where the wineries are mostly located. You have highly fragmented agricultural lands. And so when we're going through this, this process, that's the challenge that we have is that somehow we have to balance the agricultural use to what has uh, grown up over the years to sort of a, a rural residential neighborhood sort of situation. And so it's, it's, it's a balancing act that's gonna need to be struck. The other thing in closing that I will tell you is we've been moving forward. The community center issue and the winery issue with regard to events and that sort of thing are crossing paths. I think when we come back in a month, what we'll have is we'll have an overarching discussion we're supposed to come back in a month with the winery, the second workshop of the winery. We're gonna have an overarching discussion about if we're going to allow events in, in the agricultural areas connected to wineries, anything else that we might decide uh, might be appropriate to have event type uses, that maybe it would be appropriate to handle looking at event type uses in the agricultural zone districts farm, residential ag, residential forestry, in the context of uh, a broader based agro-tourism, you might have heard that term, it came up last time, ordinance which is essentially an ordinance that governs, governs tourism, events, and all that sort of thing in our agricultural zone districts. Um, other counties have done it. 
the one I've looked at recently is, is Sacramento County. And essentially, most of the counties have separated out their event center, community center uses from the agricultural zone districts, and they've handled it under a separate type ordinance. They've handled it under a winery ordinance. They've handled it under an agro-tourism ordinance. Um, it's just one way to look at it. Not exactly sure how that dovetails in now or the best way for that to work in this county, but it's something that we would like to explore and probably have um, a, a discussion about it at the next workshop. That's really all I have, unless you have any questions for me. Okay. Uh, George, I just wanted to first say that I thought this was a very thorough report in summarizing the issues and the potential options for us. I wanted to thank you for that. That's very thank helpful. Thank you. It was very much a, it was very much a group, group effort, although I stand before you, a lot of people are involved in helping me get here. And I'm assuming, I know we're going to hear from the public's input, but I'm assuming that what you would like is for us to go through each one of the highlighted items that you went through and give you some kind of direction, right? Wait. Uh, for your viewing pleasure, <laughs> what, I, what we have done is when we get to that point, I have made a question for every salient point that's in here. <laughs> that's helpful. <laughs> so, so for instance, should the definition of community center be separated into two or more definitions? We can have a discussion about that when, you, when you're ready. And then we go on. Are there zone districts that should not allow community or event? I, I, have, I have every salient question that I would like direction on or staff would like direction on today. I'd like to make a comment. Uh, George, uh, I, was, I was real pleased with your presentation, but Thank you. I had written something down at the, at the bottom of my little page here that it was you were going through all these issues. Right. And I wrote down location and size, and I think those last couple of slides where you show bigger parcels clustered, uh -huh. um, or smaller ones clustered around bigger ones, I think most of these issues are on traffic, um, visual, uh, security, noise, and stuff really relate to two things in my mind, mm -hmm. uh, maybe more, but location mm -hmm. and size of the parcel. Right. And I don't think event, and I'm just speaking to, to event centers, not wineries, but I don't think event centers can be plopped down in the middle, in my opinion, in the middle of, of, of small parcels, even if there's a big parcel there, if you're surrounded by you got you got the traffic and on Gold Hill we talked about that all the time about the right. traffic. I think you need to be near somewhat near a major arterial. You need to have a, a quite a large parcel, and I think most of these other if you have those two things, most of these other items can be addressed relatively simple. If you have a on the other hand, if you have a small parcel in a in the not so no good good location as far as traffic and stuff. Every one of these other issues are going to be a major problem. We could right. find them to the hilt, and you're still going to have problems. Right. That's all I want to say for now. Okay. Anyone else here? All right, George, we'll let you sit down for just a little bit, and we'll yep. uh, allow the public to uh, make comment. Um, doesn't seem like there's a tremendous number of people here, so if you would just confine your comments to within three or four minutes, we'd certainly appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I might want to suggest that we have a che another check-in list. Um, Kathy, do we have that? Your signatures. Here, take my pen. Just, just write it. Have them just write their name. Good morning, gentlemen. Lori Lewis, um, 6245 Wise Road. Um, the county did an awesome job in comparison, doing a comparison with um, other counties that are dealing with this issue, but what I found was lacking is how they did the enforcement. Um, how many complaints did they have? How did they process them? How long did it take? That's going to be in my arena because that's what I'm going to have to deal with. Um, George mentioned the density issue. Um, my hair stood on the back of my neck because I'm afraid that the county is going to try and rezone my area out of agriculture in order for this to move ahead. That concerns me. Uh, the other thing that concerns me with the comparison on the, the 200 foot setback example for an event center is that visually that may be okay, but auto, I'm gonna hear the music. Um, 
So the noise has been an issue for me for the last three years. I'm still dealing with it. And so, um, you know, what is the penalty if, if somebody just does what they want to do and, and waits for a consequence that doesn't come? Uh, it's not helping me. And in the mean Saturday night, I had dinner guests over, and we were trying to sit outside, and the music was so loud from a private party, but I'm up to here with music now. I couldn't even hear my own music on a stereo. I had to turn my music off because a guy half a mile away from me is playing an outside band. I called the sheriff's office. Anyway, noise is a big issue for me, and I'm not going to let it go away. I'm not going to have my property devalue because I have live music surrounding me. And that's all I have to say, gentlemen. Thank you. Can I ask you a question? Where was the live music coming from? It was coming from 2715 Mohammed Lane. I mean, it wasn't a winery, though. No, it was a private party. But um, I, 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 that's the problem is my tolerance level well, is minimal. I just want to see if it was like over in the bank center or the winery before mm -mm. Susan Ames, yet again, uh, 6330 Wise Road. I'm the corner of Wise and Gold Hill, so I'm just a couple properties down from Lori um, and share her frustration. But my question today, um, I have a short question and a proposal. The question would be, how do we come before, like the wineries come and say, okay, we want the ordinance changed. Do they come into planning with a list of demands? How do we get that process started? If that's what we need to do, to go forward on what we want to see in the community center um, changes, then I need to know that and I don't know who to ask. My other comment would be I'm a little bit frustrated between two weeks ago's meeting on the winery ordinance and today that most of the hearings that I've been to on this, there's been a proposal and then you hear the public comment for and against. Um, now I feel like we're kind of floundering because I don't see a proposal. We're trying to work out a proposal. I wonder if it wouldn't be a better use of our time and resources and your time if we could get representatives from everyone concerned and maybe set up an actual workshop give and take with someone from planning and get sketch out something that can be brought to a hearing and get input on that. I kind of feel like we're sort of picking things out of the sky. Last time um, with the winery ordinance, I made a proposal, and you have a, we have an issue because if we're one of the first ones to speak, we have everyone's attention. But then if someone comes up, and in my case, they either misunderstood or misrepresented what I proposed, and I had no forum to say, no, that isn't what I said. That wasn't what I was talking about. And I think we need to, to work that out among the interested parties before we get to this point. I don't know if that's feasible, if it's not feasible, but it's just a suggestion. Thank Maybe you. I can give you just kind of a partial answer on that in uh -huh. relationship to my interpretation, which, you know, I can be corrected. But basically, I think the purpose of these workshops so far is to help uh, come up with a proposal and I think as the process progresses, probably after the next uh, meeting or so, that uh, there will be pretty widespread uh, discussions with the various MAC meetings, probably the Agricultural yeah. Commission, over uh, a proposal that's come forward. And so I think you're going to have an opportunity to see a specific proposal, but I think these are kind of an early attempt to get the issues out as well as, you know, put, put some proposals forward that may or may not really fully meet uh, what you're viewing as an uh, ultimate proposal, but at least to give you something to sink your teeth in. So I guess all I can say from my perspective, I think we're headed your direction, but we're not quite there yet. Okay. It's just a little frustrating for me because um, we're more and more being portrayed as the anti-progress, anti-making money. You want to hold us back. You don't like, you know, agritourism. You want to stay in the dark ages. And the other side is getting the reputation, and, you know, it's it's – it goes both ways, that they're money grubbing, don't care about anybody else, but, you know, and, uh, and they're going to run down anybody in their way. And I hate to see that happen, but it seems like we're getting more and more polarized in that direction. So I was just trying to find maybe a forum where we could meet in the middle a little bit before it comes to blows or throwing wine or 
whatever. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just like to mention, we agree uh, with uh, Commissioner Johnson. This, this is the, you know, the public input process, and we're really in the early stages at this point and there will be an ordinance, a draft ordinance coming forward after we gather all this information. I have a question, Paul. When uh, anybody signs that piece of paper um, concerning their interest in this uh, particular um, process, are they notified any time that any meeting that has this information going on at a MAC, at a ag business or a commission or anything like, do they know, are they uh, um, informed that that meeting is going on so that they can attend? Yeah, th that's the idea is that will help us notify them of, you know, of upcoming workshops, meetings, and that sort. Um, hopefully there's an um, a, uh, email address put on there because that's how we, we notify them. So that's, that's, that's important that we get that information. Thank you. Hi, Tina Wilkins, 4590 Bell Road, Auburn, uh, Vina Castellano Winery. I was really glad that um, George brought those maps because there's one way to look at it as um, you have these um, agro businesses in what looks like a residential area, but one of the things I've been saying for years is we don't have a lot of farm land left to farm because we did let parcel sizes go down in the farm zone, and so we have to make those large parcels, if if we don't farm those large parcels, what ends up happening is people sell off, they can't afford to keep them in their family, so they split them, downsize them, and we are getting further and further. That's how we end up with all these small parcels. So we need whatever we can to encourage, not just the wineries and not you know community centers. I have a different opinion. I, I definitely see the difference between a community center and a winery that has occasional events to sell there promote their agricultural product. But if you don't give us the tools to farm those large parcels that are left, the very few of them that are left, then they will then become small parcels. We won't have a farm zone. We'll just be all res at, um, residential agriculture. So just keep that in mind. Good morning. My name is Don DuPont from uh, Rock Hill Winery. And uh, I'd like to make a comment about George's suggestion. I think he's right on target with respect to um, evaluating each winery on its own merit and its own uh, particular circumstances. Uh, we'll put traffic as an issue, um, uh, density, and so forth. Um, I don't know how possible this is, but I'd love to have a field trip where the Planning Commission, either in group or individually, came out to the winery so you could take a look at what I consider a benchmark design for what would work for a event center. I'm going to avoid the word community center, but an event center. Um, a lot. I made some notes when George was talking about some of the concerns and uh, comparisons in some of the other counties and what was required. I think he said Monterey County was 200 feet setback. Um, so uh, let me just go through a real quick list, and I'll, I want to extend an invitation to the Planning Commission to come out and physically see it. Uh, if, you, if you make an opinion based on something in the blind, it makes a big difference when you actually go out and see uh, the setting and the care that was taken to design um, a facility that really fits the use. Um, for example, our setback is 400 feet to the nearest neighbor. It's primarily agriculture with, uh, with about 80% of the property being uh, in vineyard. There's ample parking, two means of egress for life safety or for safety issues in case there's a fire or a paramedic or something. Um, large wide entrances, uh, turn lane off Sierra College, so there's no traffic issue in terms of getting off Sierra College to the facility. Uh, no neighbor issues at all. Uh, the structure is heavily insulated because it is a winery, so we've been able to turn up the music inside and you can stand 20 feet from the building, you can't hear it. I think that's wise instead of amplified music outside that destroys the pre, uh, tranquility. She's gone, but. <laughs> yeah, but that, that's a well, I mean, it doesn't matter if it's a neighbor, it doesn't matter if it's a neighbor or a, a commercial enterprise, it's pretty irritating. I understand that. Um, we also have a, uh, uh, 
land behind the property that was taken by eminent domain. I'm the third owner since about 1865, so these are large parcels. They're not fragmented. All the neighbors have a large parcel, so they're set back quite a ways. Uh, I think we have one neighbor within 400 feet, and the others are 1,200 feet away. So it's really an ideal situation since it's an old, um, this was owned by two separate families since the 1800s, and I'm fortunate enough to be the third owner. Um, we're fully ADA compliant. We've handled all the health and safety issues with septic, uh, three sources of water, city water, well water, and um, ditch water. So um, we're substantially uh, organic. I mean, you can't be 100%, we're pretty close to that. So I think it might be worthwhile, even if we can't do it as a group or have the next meeting there perhaps, but individually come out to the winery and let me give you a tour and show you the care that's been put into this. Uh, at this point, I think it's kind of interesting. There's a lot of effort put into this, and I'm the only applicant that's not approved. So nobody else is in line. We're not, we're not talking about 20 other facilities. I think George mentioned that. There, in the 15 years, there were very few uh, such applicants. For, for communities. Yeah, for exactly. Some, uh, like a community right. center as defined. And, and I think it's support. important also to, uh, to uh, continue that thought process of, of uh, dividing the, the, the community center from event center, uh, they're two different things, I think. Uh, they're closely related, but they're two different things entirely. Parcel size is important in terms of uh, being isolated and not uh, um, being a nuisance to neighbors. So um, I don't know what the chances are of having a meeting at my winery at this point. The only staff member that's been there is uh, Michael Johnson. He's the only one that's been out to see the facility. Um, and I think it would make a big difference if you actually had a chance to come out and take a look and see uh, what it looks like and maybe become a benchmark for what should be planned. I'm, uh, I, think, I, I think you all know this. I'm from Sonoma County originally, so when I came here, I had pretty lofty ideas for what I was going to do um, and then realized that there's no there was no real clear ordinance on uh, getting a use permit. So at this point, uh, frankly, I was asked to continue the paperwork process for my application, but I'm not sure if I fall under the moratorium or if uh, during the meeting when Villa Weiss was approved that I would be exempt from that moratorium. But in either case, I'm sure the standards will change and the property speaks for itself. Any questions? Well, first of all, I want to thank you for the invitation. I think it's a great place. You should come and see it. It's, uh, it's agriculture. You know, it's, it's a big parcel. It's set back. It's done uh, wisely. I guess I, I have one, one question. So you were, after your community center application or event center application, and I guess my question is, are you looking at more than just um, – doing wine events or things that pertain to wine? Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's one of the problems with the current language in the wine ordinance. Um, through one of the planners, I told it the story before, but they gave me a, I took a blank sheet of paper and she says, give me the six events that you want to have. And I put down fundraisers for this and school, uh, um, a school fundraiser and a, a number of things like that. And she looked at the list and said, not one item is acceptable. And I said, well, why not? They're all, uh, we can't have a fundraiser for breast cancer or whatever else. No, uh, it has to be wine related. And I said, well, there will be a lot of wine drinking. So um, is that going to work? No, it's got to be wine related. So I'm not sure. I think that's part of the problem. Frankly, I'm okay for getting the whole idea of event center if the language could be changed in the community, in the, in the wine ordinance to allow an occasional event and be legal. Right now that's happening and people aren't legal. So, you know, I, at, least, I, at least we're going through the process of trying to get people to, uh, to comply and be legal. So I hope I answered the question, but. Yeah, no, you, you answered. Maybe more, more really than you wanted, but. Through this whole process, it's been the, the agricultural zoning and residential ag and all right. that. And right. so I, I guess through this, I'm, I'm sort of looking at it as an event center versus agro-tourism and winery, yeah. and what goes on in the ag versus the 
a commercial recreational use right. zone. No, no question. And that's hotel zoning, whatever. Yeah, and that's exactly why we need to evaluate each facility on its own merit. Um, Del Mar has industrial park. It has commercial stuff. So it's not like it's zoned residential ag, but it's not like it's not free from some commercial uh, on the same street. So um, I think this is a special circumstance. Uh, and it makes sense. And we're not going to have an event every weekend. Uh, there can be a, a, a limited number of events. Um, there could be a limited number of people at the events, which is already the case because you can only have an event large enough um, based on what your septic issues are. And they're not going to allow you to bring in portable toilets like uh, winery events. So there's, so there's um, pros and cons to the event center versus the wine ordinance. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anyone else wishing to speak? Hi there. I'm Jeff Evans, 2751 Comby Road in Meadow Vista and uh, representing Bear River Winery. I uh, spoke a couple weeks ago when we had the winery ordinance meeting. Um, my property is zoned resort, and um, in 2008, it was eliminated from having the ability to uh, have a winery, um, and uh, that was with a broad brush stroke by the planning department. Before that, I could get an MUP and be a winery, but uh, in 2008, they, they eliminated me. and. Uh, I, uh, my property, you know, resort is a commercial zoning, and my property is adjacent to um, a gravel quarry. It used to be the Chevreau uh, Quarry in Meadow Vista. Uh, there's also a concrete batch plant there. Uh, there's an asphalt plant. During peak usage, um, a few years ago, we clocked uh, 300 trucks per day, double, double haul uh, gravel trucks uh, going in and out of the quarry. So there's quite a bit of traffic there. In the uh, seven or eight weeks that we've been in business as a fledgling winery, our peak day was five cars. And, uh, you know, we've had two nil weekends. No one even showed up. So I don't think we're having a, a major impact um, on, on road traffic, um, although the county originally asked for $7,000 in mitigation fees for traffic mitigation. But uh, we haven't done any events yet. Um, you know, I'm hoping to be able to do some events. There's an event coming up that's being sponsored by the PCVA, the uh, Grape Days of Summer. I'd like to participate. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, in, in my area right there, there's a lot of noise from the quarry when it is operating. They have a, a, a rock crusher back there, and so there's, there's quite a bit of noise all day long. When I moved in there, I had to sign a uh, right-to-farm uh, release basically saying that my neighbors had the, the right to farm and that could be, you know, noise even at odd hours um, because, uh, you know, you, can, you might be running a, a tractor out there at night. Um, it's very common for wineries to go out and spray at night because that's when there's, there's no wind. So there'd be people outside 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, spreading uh, sulfur dust or, you know, something like that. And uh, I'm really curious in this um, ag area that you guys have been discussing, the, the farm zone, as, as, as Tina calls it. Um, how many of these people that are complaining here today are actually doing any farming out there? Uh, I don't hear you asking that question. Uh, the people that are doing wineries, they are. They, they, they're growing grapes. They have vineyards. And, and uh, you know, I'm just curious, the people that, that don't want wineries to proceed in this county and don't want community centers to proceed in this county or events at wineries, you know, how many of them are actually doing anything like that? Or, you know, what I'm curious about is, you know, are these flatlanders, as people call them, that come up here to retire and they buy something out in this peaceful, bucolic setting and, and they're expecting to only be able to hear the birds chirping and, you know, the uh, uh, squirrels barking. Um, but, you know, people have been here a long time. You know, maybe, you know, they'd like to be able to use their land and, and, and farm on there. With me... It's even uh, more of a quagmire because uh, uh, the resort zoning, it's a commercial zoning, and like I mentioned, I'm next to industrial property. With the current uh, winery ordinance, I'm being mandated to plant an acre of grapes. 
And I just wonder, you know, there's a lot of commercial land that's in unincorporated Placer County. You go down Highway 49, you know, there, there, there's, there's uh, a lot of opportunity there to, you know, buy some acreage and, and uh, you know, put in a winery. Are we going to mandate, you know, that all commercial property also become ag because we're using this broad brush stroke, you know, with ordinances um, to, uh, you know, force people into a certain mold? And, uh, you know, I think um, that would be like having Coca-Cola, you know, mandated, uh, you know, a Coca-Cola plant mandated to, uh, you know, plant uh, uh, <coughs> cocoa trees, uh, you know, out, outside uh, because they go together, or uh, you know, a beer, a beer brewery. Let's say somebody put a beer a microbrewery on Highway 49. Would they have to have uh, 10 acres of hops out there in order to uh, you know be um, quote uh, you know uh, okay with uh, the agricultural commission in this this county? Um, I think that would be a little bit uh, um, you know over the top to you know mandate things like that, and I think that. What we're doing right now is over the top in the ordinance. I think each each different you know winery maybe has you know a different set of circumstances, and uh, we ought to be thinking about that. Resort, uh, you know, I was uh, uh, on the MAC previously in Meadow Vista, and there was a presentation um, I don't know six months ago by the county, and um, they came in and talked about community centers and event centers, and one of the things they pointed out was that on resort land. Um, it's by right to have a community center right now. And so I'm, you know, my fear is, you know, I'm, the, the, the ability to have a community center is maybe uh, adding value to the property, especially, you know, when it's next to industrial zoning. And um, while I may not do a community center in my lifetime, you know, to have that ability on that property, you know, adds value to that property. And what I see happening in this county is that we're probably going to go do some broad brush stroke because of a handful of people that don't like noise, you know, in the, the farm zone where noise should be allowed. And uh, we're going to eliminate, uh, you know, my property from the ability sometime in the future to have a community center. And I think that would be a real travesty uh, for, you know, this uh, board or, you know, for the, the board of supervisors to do that. And, uh, you know, so I think, you know, we ought to really think carefully about the different zoning districts and uh, the different locales uh, when you're, you know, passing a new ordinance. And, and really, you know, if we have to protect people in res ag, then, you know, let's do so. But when we're talking about commercial property, we ought to, you know, give it the full ability to be utilized for what, you know, was envisioned, uh, you know, when, when zoning, you know, took place in, in Placer County. Any questions? Thank you. Anyone? Good morning. Marilyn Jasper. Uh, just want to have you consider a few other things. The staff report is wonderful. And I had not seen these maps, uh, which really frame part of the problem. It's uh, in the 45 years that I've lived in Placer County, I wasn't active earlier, but I'm seeing how important it is to stick to the zoning and not allow variances. I don't know if, this, if these are all 10-acre minimums and you look at it and you've got two, three, four, five-acre parcels. There had to have been variances granted. Okay, that horse has left the barn. We, we can't go back there. But what it does is for those of us on those 3.5 acres that have invested, we, whether we're growing ag products or not, whether we're selling them, bartering, whatever we're doing, it doesn't matter. We have a right to the ambiance of that rural agricultural, residential agricultural uh, community. And I, I totally am I'm sympathetic to somebody that wants to have uh, an agricultural, commercial, big uh, operation. And that's fine. That's great. But then it's been stated before, as soon as it moves into events and these other things, that's where we're going to have some problems with those of us on the smaller. Um, with, the, with regard to the noise, music is a problem. Uh, I, that's obvious. But also, 
Uh, last weekend, my neighbors had a party. Music wasn't the problem. It was screaming. And at first you thought, ooh, somebody in trouble, because you, you had to wait a little bit to hear the laughter and hope that it wasn't uh, more serious, should I be calling 911. And so it's, it's not just music. It's this... Um, it, it, it's, it's something that, that you don't want to be sitting, as someone mentioned, out on your deck. You, you want to go in and, and close the doors. Um, and one other little thing, uh, at a MAC meeting, someone said, oh, you can call the sheriff if there's violations. And I don't know if it was, has been mentioned here before, the sheriff immediately spoke up and said, no, we don't do code enforcement. Noise is a different thing. We'll come out for noise and, and drunk driving, of course, but they won't do code enforcement. So it's interesting if some kind of uh, memorandum of agreement is created between the sheriff and the county. Um, and the last thing is we talk about property values, and uh, I think that people who invest in these s smaller parcels, whether they're growing their own vegetables or gardening, whatever they're doing, um, they have a right to their prop to to doing what's needed to keep their property values uh, solid, stable. And there are people who may be saying, I'm bailing. Uh, this is, I can't tolerate this, whether it's a dog barking or a noisy neighbor, whatever it is. And I think that's what these are. I, I, I don't want to go there, but I think we have to look at all of these aspects. Thank you. Carol Rubin, uh, 2079 Country Hill Run in Newcastle, and I'd like to address uh, some specifics of uh, uh, the uh, staff report and also some of the comments made earlier. Um, to reference Mr. Evans' comments, I am the archetypical flatlander who moved up here to retire three years ago. I saved all my life to buy my little five acres. Um, it means every much, every bit as much to me as their property means to the winery owners. And it's not, it's not the farming noise that, that we're not comfortable with. It's noise like the raging party that Ms. Lewis mentioned, which was clearly audible from my house at 1 a.m. And if I spoke Spanish, I could have told you the words that were being sung along to the mariachi band. Um, and even that, okay, that was one night, and they had a raging quinceanera or whatever it was, and they're not likely to have another one real soon. The trouble is with the community center, event center issues, is when all of the wineries in our area decide, yes, we want to have events too, and now you don't have one annoying party until 1 a.m. at a private residence. You have three or four of them, every Friday and Saturday night. And, and that's what we're looking at. We're looking at some cumulative effects as the wineries try to improve their marketing strategies. We understand, you know, the, their need to uh, have an income. Um, I want to say, uh, uh, with reference to the staff report, I thought it was an excellent uh, presentation of the issues. And I also want to thank Mr. Rososco for his excellent presentation here. I thought he laid them out very fairly. Um, I only have one, one warning flag that I want to raise. And that is, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the grand jury report that came out on the winery uh, code enforcement review. And that's kind of a misnomer because there's nothing about grape growing that's referenced in this code enforcement issues in, in this report. It, it's all about events. It's the noise and the traffic and, and uh, how do we enforce them? And uh, one of the chief problems mentioned in the grand jury's report was the vagueness of the language. I'm going to read you just one short section here from the report. Uh, what's currently in the winery ordinance, development and operational standards, the following development and operational standards shall apply to all wineries. These standards will be applied with flexibility to encourage wine grape growing consistent with the agricultural use of the property. Wineries established prior to the adoption date of this ordinance will be afforded maximum flexibility in establishing reasonable standards when adding new uses. 
And the grand jury says in a comment um, on this paragraph, how does CDRA quantify for enforcement purposes the phrases applied with flexibility and will be afforded maximum flexibility? So I strongly urge you folks, both you and, and uh, planning staff and at the planning commission, to back away from that kind of language. And what raised that red flag for me was on page, um, geez, am I going to find it now? Page four of the staff report, there we see in the second paragraph, the planning commission wanted the decision makers to be allowed the greatest amount of flexibility in any review of a community center application. I plead with you, don't put that language in the code. It just leads to the kind of trouble that we've been experiencing now for the last two years. I agree there should be some flexibility but you've also got to have some bright line specifications that say these are the kinds of properties that are appropriate for this use and we're so sorry folks if you don't fit at least most of these characteristics you don't have a prayer of getting a, being approved for a community center and that'll take away these two-year battles that are um, exhausting, expensive, and just non-productive for all of us. So people know right away, is my property going to be approved for this kind of use? Um, just um, to say several of us I know have been working on some specific suggestions for solutions to the issues raised um, in Mr. Rosasco's uh, uh, questions that he posted at the end that were going to brought, be brought up to the Planning Commission. I hope during the coming week we will be ready to present them both to the Planning Commission and to Planning Services. And thank you very much. Thank you. I might want to mention that we were sent after it was mentioned last at the last meeting that, grand, that the grand jury had a report. I think Blue Kathy sent us an email with that grand jury report attached. So right. we had a copy of it. So thanks for bringing that up. Good morning, Patricia Burke, 1700 Country Hill Run, New Castle. I want to thank George and his cohorts for, the, for listening to us and encapsulating our concerns as well as doing the research in the other counties and bringing that forward to us. I want to thank our planning director for making sure that we all get noticed. I want to thank all of you for listening. One of the issues I'd like to bring up is there are some Macs, like the Rural Lincoln Mac, that really take seriously citizens' concerns and respond to them. There are other Macs, and I won't mention any names, where unfortunately uh, the supervisor's aides sort of poo-poo what we think needs to be done. So that's one issue. Um, my other two issues, and I don't think they can be stressed enough, is compliance, enforcement and compliance, compliance and enforcement, and density. And thank you. And I also want to say I was pretty insulted by <coughs> a previous person's testimony. Um, some of us have had property in Placer County for our families for many, 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 many years. And it's insulting when you can, are concerned about your family property to be dismissed as a flatlander. Thank you. I'm sorry, any questions? <laughs> Anyone else wishing to speak? Okay. <clears throat> I'll bring this back to Mr. Chairman. Can we take a break? <laughs> Can we uh, drink for like five minutes, if anybody uh, checks? I guess, you really need, I guess you really needed a break. Yes. <laughs> I guess, no. guess Richard.
your discussion your... back? Discussion here on the panel, and if uh, Mr. Moss. A lot of the problem that, that is, is, is needs to be dealt with probably relates more to a noise ordinance than it does to the winery or community center. And until there's some teeth in that, um, it doesn't matter what we do around it. That that's still going to be an issue until there's some enforcement ability and some true penalties for violating it, it's the rest of the problem isn't gonna go away no matter what we do <coughs> to regulate the winery issue and that kind of thing and the event centers. Um, comment came to mind when it was Mr. Evans, I believe it was speaking about his. I think there needs to be some kind of distinguish between a true commercial winery operation versus an agricultural issue and it seems to me that when he's got a commercial piece of property it's more of a commercial winery than it is an agricultural operation and needs to have some sort of provision to be dealt with differently um, and then I think when we were talking earlier today about building size limitations I think if we start doing that we're going to force more of these events to be held outside and then we're going to have more noise issues and that type of thing um, i think if somebody can build a large building on an agricultural piece of property to house animals then they should be able to build that same sort of building for other purposes too um, as long as it helps contain some of the other problems and issues to an inside issue i think it, it again makes the noise um, noise issue less um, less likely if it's an inside event so reducing building size limitations I think it's probably more relates to the total number of people and traffic and the total number of events as opposed to building size or the other things um, but as uh, Ms. Lewis said you know her issue with noise the other day wasn't related to an agricultural event it was just related to a neighbor and there's still no teeth to deal with with the noise ordinance and and get peace and quiet at a reasonable hour at your house which isn't something I think that's an unreasonable expectation for any of us to have I think that's all my comments you, for Dave. now I'm sure there'll be more but <laughs> um, can, can I just say something real quick Mr. Severson he asked yeah. first yeah Oh, I was. Uh, who, who's first? You. I'm first. Okay. <laughs> well, I think this. I reached a conclusion th that hearing the issues and hearing the comments and trying to rationale our way through this process, that the only reasonable way to make this work is a use permit process. And I think the use permit processes can be done, and it can be done for each project each time. And then you can target the noise issues or the traffic issues or the whatever issues they are and the public comment issues uh, for each application. I don't think there's going to be that many applications at all. I think it's just a handful. And so to try to put every, cross every T and dot every I and make it perfect by writing ordinances sometimes just isn't the way to approach it. I think, I think there's not going to be that many of them, and I think they could be dealt with individually in a use permit process, and and all the th issues raised, targeted, resolved, whether it's noise or traffic or what it is, in the process. And then you have also the hammer over the the applicant if he doesn't perform according to his permit, you can withdraw it. And so I think, uh, for me. I think we would be better off just to establish some standards that we think are appropriate for these types of things as guidelines and let the applicant file an application and, and, you, and you can either turn it down or tailor it to suit the circumstances of that particular location and place. Uh, I think to try to do a one shoe fits all, all people is just not going to work. Thank you. Mr. Nader. I want to propose to the Planning Commission that for, I believe, expediency and greater clarity to uh, give direction to the staff 
that we, and rather than giving specific sort of run through our list of concerns or issues, that we just address them through giving uh, the questions that they have put together for us, because I believe that we can address each one of them and as a consensus between the, our group, decide which would be the best way for them, rather than just giving them a, gun, uh, a shotgun sort of effect of uh, what we're trying, you know, individualized positions. So again, for just, I think, moving the process along a little quicker, I think we ought to just kind of start hitting each one of these questions and then get a consensus again amongst ourselves where we're going. You know, I can hear that, but, uh, and there may be others, you know, I have some thoughts I'd like to present to you that, and we can go through the individual questions and maybe some of them become kind of mute as we get through this, but uh, at any rate, I have a couple thoughts. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, let me just just say that, uh, Richard, I think that, uh, you know, and I appreciate that we all have feelings in, uh, of how things should be addressed in this, I, but I really think a lot of it's going to get flushed out through those questions, and if they don't, then we can certainly address any that are left out there. Um, it, again, it's less of a gun, you know, shotgun effect, but, you know, uh, I'm just yeah, throwing well, that as an idea for the well, well, Yeah, I hear that idea, but I guess, you know, I'm kind of with Larry on this. Uh, you know, ultimately, we're going to have to take a, what, you, what a lot of people call a 10,000-foot view. And if we get boiled down into issues individually too soon, then we're not taking the proper look. At, uh, and so if we have that view, then sure, we can get into the details. But I, I think I have a bigger view than just the details. Okay, well, I for one happen to agree with Mr. Nader. I do believe also that some of these questions are going to, uh, there needs to be a hierarchy. Some need to be answered before others, and once those are answered, some other questions may fall by the side. Uh, obviously, as Richard says, every aspect needs to be paid attention to, but some need to be addressed first so that other ones can fall into line with them. And I had a question for Mr. Severson. Um, when you were talking about uh, bringing back uh, the event or the event center for uh, review, their mm -hmm. application to be an, uh, have an event center or an application to have each event brought back? For, no, it would uh, be you'd have the application for the yeah. for the event center for in, the in center. its entirety in the beginning, and you would take or maybe if the guy has 200 acres, you the, the bottom line would be different or what you would approve or consider approving mm -hmm. would certainly be different than if he came in with a five or seven or ten acre parcel with neighbors right next door so I guess that my point here is that I think it would uh, it would give you the opportunity to tailor the application to to the community's needs and, and concerns so easy because you can control noise you can control a lot of things a lot easier if the threat is that you're going to lose your permit and you're not going to be in business next month if you don't adhere to it, mm -hmm. than it is if uh, you think that, you know, you got to get the sheriff out there and do certain things. Well, next next time they have a meeting, you've forgotten it, you know. And so I just think that it's an easier way to control uh, these kinds of issues because the only one that can control them is the applicant and the owner of the property and the person that's doing it. And if you... Uh, if you don't really have a great hand handle on the person and the activity, then you're not going to get much satisfaction. And so I think it's important that we're able to tailor a lot of the application to the to the site each time. And that's why I feel that a use permit process is, is far more uh, appropriate. Plus, it, it gives the opportunity for the public to have input at the time of the application and, and explain what they think some of these Characteristics of this project are and and should be adhered to, whereas uh, uh, sometimes if you have it all spelled out and and it's in writing and it, it just doesn't quite get there, you know, it doesn't address the real issues. And I think uh, I don't know. I'm I'm hoping that that it isn't a runaway process here that we are going to have one on every lot in the foothills. I, I think we need to think about enough, you know, do we want to try to spread them out? Well, we can do it by use permit pretty easy rather than trying to 
eliminate. But we, but we still would have to have a, a laundry list, like I think somebody down there mentioned, of, sta yeah. of standards. Of oh, I agree. I think there should be something that, that's a guideline for staff to give to the applicant when he walks in the door and says, these are the kind of things the use permit and the hearing is going to address. Be prepared. And I think that's a big help, and it's a big help for the applicant and the staff to know what con what considerations are we concerned about? Or if we even if even I should make an application, right. you know, if they say you have to do this, right, this, right, this, if it's, that, it, that, and then a lot of the properties would fall out, mm -hmm. and and they might just think the cost of adhering to the process is too great, and and I just you know you wouldn't want to have a particular road just lined with these things, you know, if you have got a good justification not to do it, you just say sorry, uh, we don't think it's the right place at the right time. I was going to say, Mickey, just based on what you uh, initially were saying a few minutes ago and that uh, how we start this process is that uh, plan commission or the planning staff has come back with a proposed new language of definition for the community center and event center, and they are radically different. I mean, one is on sort of viewed as more on public property, one is viewed on private property. Uh, the probably opportunity for community centers is probably going to be very limited. Uh, event centers, I think that's more where we're going to be focusing our attention is on event centers is really where the, uh, where I think the, most of the issues are going to be. So uh, to me, I think if you're, if you're separating these two out, I'm not really too concerned about the community center as proposed by the staff, but I am really concerned about the event center side. I'd like to address that because that's where I'm coming from. Okay, Richard. And I read the definition for a community center and event center and we kind of jumped into this at the very beginning. I think it actually was probably jumped in at the Board of Supervisors meeting. And when I read the definitions as presented, I have a really difficult time distinguishing between them. You know, community center, clearly that's, uh, you know, for the public, a place for the public to meet. And event centers on somebody's private property. And uh, they could have any kind of party they want. Uh, at a community center, they can have any kind of party they want. You know, if we're going to have different, I mean, if you have a Grange Hall that they're making too much noise, then uh, that's a problem for the Grange Hall too. And so the distinction between these two definitions is very narrow. And I kind of go along with uh, George because, uh, you know, really what we're talking about primarily in this issue is the agricultural land. And uh, you can go around the county and find uh, uh, community centers in commercial districts. And they may have an operation that's out in the residential ag area too. And they may have weddings now. And they're called community centers under the old thing. Now maybe they would be event centers, but maybe not. Granges, uh, you know, I don't know for sure. But my suspicion is that a grange is like a nonprofit. And if you looked at the... Uh, property that they sit on, it's uh, private property. And I don't know, it, you know, maybe some granges are owned by the county, but I don't think so. I think veterans halls normally are owned by the county. And so by using these definitions, it seems like we're distinguishing operations that seemingly are solely for profit versus operations that are sort of for profit. You don't run a grange hall without charging or a veteran, and the more parties you can have, the easier it is to keep the lights on. And so the impacts of a Grange Hall can be relatively large. Also, they're on a small parcel. They're not on a big parcel. They're on one of these small parcels, and they have neighbors in the residential agricultural area, and so they can cause just as big a problem as a person with a private thing. And so at any rate, uh, I think for me, uh, you know, we can kind of steer away from the community center thing, but I think we need to talk about agriculture and we need to make a nexus with agriculture. You know, if somebody is, uh, has got agriculture on their property, and ideally I saw a recommendation that they be in the Williamson Act. You know, I think that's a good recommendation because uh, the Williamson Act gives some assurance that they're going to keep their property in agriculture. And then if they need to support themselves to establish a community center, then uh, that's good. You know, I mean, they have another, another vehicle to get property, a profit from their property, and maybe that gives them a good chance to keep their property in a larger 
parcel size and uh, in agriculture for a longer period of time. And then if they decide to drop their Williamson Act contract, then, uh, you know, then they're not agriculture anymore and they don't have a community center anymore. But at any rate, I think uh, if you look at the bigger picture and maybe get out of the mode of an event center versus a community center and maybe look at it the way Larry's looking at it with some guidelines and uh, focus more for what we're calling event center on agricultural lands where the issue really lies right now that we're discussing, that uh, we'd be better off. And also, uh, you know, we have a lot of existing operations and if we get too specific here, we might muck up uh, their ability really to continue in the fashion that they're continuing because of the problems that maybe they were already causing. So, and then I agree too, uh, you know, I mean, you know, I think we've all been to, uh, or at least I have been to weddings on private land, on agricultural land, and I know uh, our Elks organization at least has an annual picnic in the residential agricultural zone, and somebody's kind enough to let their property uh, be uh, used for that, a barbecue, but, uh, and there's going to, there's always going to be 5% of the population that uh, no matter what, they're going to cause their neighbors a big problem and have a big party every weekend and it's totally unregulated. And uh, one thing that distinguishes about uh, the property is to go through the process of getting a conditional use permit, they're regulated. And like Larry says, if they violate it, uh, they run the risk of uh, losing their permit. And so at any rate, uh, you know, we can go through the individual items, but, uh, you know, I do object to uh, penalizing folks for having a commercial use a little bit beyond just their agricultural use in, in the farm zone. And I do think that uh, we need to address this issue as a farm zone issue or maybe res ag, ag and uh, forestry issue and not mess up uh, some of the other zoning that is going on right now, but that's only my thought. I think we need to broaden it, but we can get in the details later, but we need to think of this more broadly and maybe not just jump to the distinction that we've already drawn. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, George, how many questions did you have? You only showed us two. Is there a bunch of other ones after this, or? Are they in our staff report? Uh, I, I just had seven. Ten or eleven? No, 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 I apologize. Okay. Um, what did you just say, George? <laughs> I'm, so, I, I'm sorry. I, I didn't realize my mic wasn't on. I think there's about 10 or 11 questions. A lot of, of what you've discussed has been touched on. I did want to put one piece of clarification that I heard. Um, Commissioner Johnson mentioned the Williamson Act. Um, in my staff report, I didn't say actually put them into the Williamson Act. I said that they meet the same requirements that are required to enter into a Williamson Act contract. If they're in a Williamson Act contract, um, there might be some conflicts with regard to having event center type uses. So it would just be the standard that you use to put something in the Williamson Act could be applied to determine if an ag use exists, if you wanted to, to make sure an ag use exists. I think there's a minimum acreage on what you can get into the Williamson Act. Yeah. It, 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 I, it used to be, I thought, 80 acres, mm. uh, but maybe it's a smaller it, now. It's they may have smaller modified it, but it has to be a viable ag operation. Actually, I believe it's 100, although that could be combined with smaller parcels together to make one preserve. Mm. Uh, okay. I, I, I guess I'll make my my comment and actually it's should definitions community center be separated into two or more definitions and and when i'm sitting listening to all this within it whether it's an event center community center and our whole focus is along the agricultural rural residential issue versus other zonings. I mean, the only only one that came up was Jeff's deal up at Meadow Vista, and actually, I look at his operation as a bottling plant, not a winery. I mean, it's completely different from a vineyard winery aspect. So I sort of discount that that portion of it. My my thoughts on this that we need to take the quote 
event center, unimpeded every day of the week, allowing any kind of event where I could bring my whole office staff over and have lunch at these centers or somebody could come in and do whatever they want. It has to be something that would be involved with agriculture. And I know they're probably all thinking, well, then what about the weddings and everything? If we have a limited number of outside events that they could do, pretty much like what they do now, where they go in and, and get a permit and they're allowed X number a year, but everything is focused on what they're doing and what their core business is. After listening to what's going on and, and being involved in this, I just sort of see this event center on ag land and, you know, evolving into an event center and then the agriculture is part of it, sort of falls by the wayside. Sort of the, the Knott's Berry Farm, the, you know, I mean, you, I think we could all come up with a whole bunch of different um, scenarios that, that would happen, but if it was, if the focus is on agriculture and keeping, keeping these areas in agriculture, I think we just need to separate something that would pertain to wineries, any kind of agricultural use, and then event centers need to be looked at maybe whether it's a zoning issue or it's a parcel size that's so big that if somebody has 40 acres of grapes and a, and a winery and has a place where they're out in the middle of it and they, they have their big barn or whatever, there, that, that would be the exception, as Larry was saying, with the use permit that you might, might look at it, but sort of separate it, break it down a little bit more because I, I still see us having the issues if we address all these and, and somebody has a five acre with an event center on it and stuff, that eventually it's agricultural zone property, but it, th that really falls, falls to the side. And I think the biggest issue is, is if we're trying to protect the agricultural aspect of the land, we need to, to look at that separately from the event center definition. George, can I ask you about the question you have up there right now? Uh, you say separate into two or more definitions. Right. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, right now, um, staff believes that we've, we've captured sort of the essence of what we'd like to do with regard to community center definitions, what was proposed, what was talked about, about having a commercial type event center and then an actual community-based event center. The reason it says two or more is there's, there's a possibility that you could refine it during our conversations with the public and with the commission that, uh, and the workshops that something might come up that would even, um, maybe we could refine it even, excuse me, refine it even further into more definitions if that seemed appropriate. Um, because your proposed sort of definition of a community mm -hmm. center and an event center mm -hmm. really already kind of break that out. Because I'm assuming you're just kind of putting it as a subset of a community center as an event center in the way you're asking that question. And it could have more subsets. Uh, it, it, it could. At, at this point, it would be something that, that right now we have what we think is two examples of a definition that, that cover what needs to be covered. But if something else comes up, we could have more um, refining. We could even put in a third if there's something we haven't considered. Are you aware of, uh, let's say, with the Mount Pleasant Hall mm -hmm. and the Grange Hall here in yeah. Auburn? Yeah. Have there been issues with noise or other use issues with those properties? Have you heard of anything? I, I have not heard of any, um, because I also supervise code enforcement. Um, we have not received any complaints with regard to noise from Mount Pleasant Grange or the Mount Vernon Grange Hall. There have been some noise complaints with regards to the uh, Gold Hill, I think it's Gold Hill Grange Hall, there have been noise complaints uh, with that facility. Uh, what I would like to add to the discussion, we do have a list of questions here, but it's not meant to be 
definitive and 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 the totality of what's here. The issues raised by Mr. Denio are the I, I think the greater issue here. Is it appropriate to have event centers in rural agricultural areas? I think getting some guidance and direction on that would provide some input into how responses are provided to the other questions that are up. Uh, what, we're, what we're looking for is just some general direction so that staff can go back and start to define what an ordinance may look like. But the big issue is, is it appropriate to have event centers in these rural areas, uh, especially with some of the land fragmentation issues that uh, were discussed previously? Well, you posed the question of whether we should blend the winery ordinance into the, let's say, event center ordinance. And if that's the case, then yeah, we're going to be having those because of the wineries are out in the agricultural area. So I, I don't know. Do, do we have sort of a, a thought on that with whether we want to see those get blended together? There are, you know, whether under more of an ag tourism sort of uh, view with these event centers. You know, I, I, I agree with that. I guess yeah. maybe the question I have is uh, that, you know, everybody has a a view of what an event center is in their mind. And at least in my mind, the, the definition that is in our staff report talks about a distinction between a for-profit versus uh, a more community-based uh, center. But I think, uh, I, don't, I don't know if that really answers the question for me, what an event center really is. I think there's more to it than just making that distinction. And, you know, if we're making a distinction between commercial and non-commercial, then I think that's maybe a little bit discriminatory when uh, Kim wants to take his staff out to uh, the country to have a, a meeting in the farm zone, then uh, he's going to have to pay for that and it could be on private property. And that private property may not be focused solely on a community type thing. And so uh, at any rate, we need to somehow put some more meat on the bone and I think in what we're talking about, we're talking really about not wineries, we're talking about all of agriculture and we're talking about the parcel sizes and locations and some properties may be suitable for a, an event center and uh, other properties may not, you know, and a lot of that is going to have to be ultimately judgmental. Right. But, uh, you know, I guess getting back to the point, uh, as it currently stands, I really can't see clearly what the distinction is between a community center and an event center. It seems very fuzzy to me right now. I agree, and I think we probably should make that definition a little more consistent so that community centers as they exist now can be uh, continued and used as they are, and that event centers can be then defined and then uh, used where appropriate, and if they're going to be tied into agriturismo, then conditional use permits per application would be seemingly responsible. But the idea that um, having a definition for community center versus an offense center seems to be a pretty good idea, especially if you're going to have uh, event centers in all the zones. Well, I think that's that was the point I was trying to make with agriculture yeah. Yeah. being different because could have a winery, you know. Right, and so have, if you have an event, have center. a big rock band come in, you know, once they're set up for it, and keep on going, and then there's no yeah. more farming. Yeah, well, that's just and it. Pretty if, soon, you know, If you have an event center, center, then you can can you can further define it to answer a lot of these questions that are coming up. Whether okay, an event center in a commercial zone is not going to be the same as an event center uh, in a ag residential zone. Absolutely, it'll have to be tied into something different, um, and so. I think the definitions to be uh, um, separated and, and more defined would seemingly be reasonable for us to do. Well, and then the, the, the event centers in the agricultural zones were originally provided for to help promote the agriculture, and if we're going to lose that component and just basically well, make it a quasi-commercial event center, I think that's a problem too. Well, yeah, but then you at least have a definition of what those quasi-event centers can do and can't do, and if there's a problem, they can come to us for a permit review on it. As it is now, it's it's so scattered that I have a hard time, just yeah, like Richard says, anything. defining the difference between the two. And somebody's trying to take this kind of an act over into this kind of zone. I don't think that's going to work. So I think that 
defining the community center versus an event center is an appropriate move for us to make. And then I think I after that, then the event centers have to be further defined where in the zoning they're allowed. And then, as Mr. Jefferson says, when they're being tied into agroturismo, then there's a further event, uh, a further definition that we would apply to, to each uh, um, center as it comes into our purveyance. Okay, so question one important? looks like the majority of us feel it should be separated into a couple of definitions. Can we go to question two? Yes. <laughs> Did, I'll did, take that under did, advice. So, how, so how, many, how many definitions, of, you know, or how many definitions should we have? I I, uh, I, I see existing. I guess I I sort of take the Mount Pleasant Hall and some of the older ones mm -hmm. because I'm familiar with them and, and you know some of them aren't really close where somebody's right. living right next door to them and stuff and they're right. set right on the the roadway and usually. Most of them are so old that they're not not used like right. what right. You, you know we've heard today with the wineries and stuff. What what I would tell you is uh, based on the conversation about the definitions and that sort of thing, staff needs to to go back and we need to do a little bit more work. We probably need to beef up the existing two definitions. We need to provide some options with maybe further defining an event center that would be in a commercial district versus a um, agricultural district. Some of those things, like I alluded to earlier, we can bring that back in, in, in the winery workshop because it's, it's very germane, which is coming up next month. Can I, can I ask them, is there any possibility we could uh, change the winery ordinance or winery workshop into more of an agricultural yeah, uh, and workshop, an agricultural um, yeah. ordinance? Because it, it shouldn't be special to wineries. Right. It should be to mandarin farmers and rice farmers. It's, it's farming. Is basically what we're talking. Yeah, about. That, that that would ultimately take board direction. Right now, we have a winery ordinance that has been adopted by the board. Uh, Can we recommend there have the there have been staff has brought forward yeah. issues that have been identified by the planning commission relative to other agricultural uses. And I think as this process moves forward, we may expand beyond just a winery ordinance into an agricultural ordinance. Right. Okay. Um, but I, I just I, I, I want to caution the commission that right now we do have a, a winery ordinance in place, right. and until the the board provides direction, can we recommend well, to the board? It, it, it would be appropriate that? for the commission to make such a recommendation if if uh, agreed to. Yeah, I'm meeting in about an hour with the head of the county and one of the supervisors. I'd be happy to give them the message. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you if you did that, and staff that. even brought it staff forward. Want to do it. Oh, yeah. just, you'll, it won't need a, a motion in, to bring it forward. I don't think. Direction yeah. by the chairman. Yeah, all powerful yeah. chairman. Yes. That's a consensus. Question two. Uh, you've alluded to this already in a lot of conversations. Are there zone districts that should not allow community centers or event centers? Does anyone, you've talked about a lot. Do you have any other thoughts or things that you would like to add? I think well, certain zone districts should definitely restrict the, right. you know, whether That's they're playing right. not allowed versus size and, and intensity restrictions depending on the zone district or something like that. Uh, Which you, kind of goes back to the discussion we had about size and so forth. And yeah. Well, if we're tying if we're tying these to agriculture, uh, you would want agricultural zoning for the, the event centers that were taking place in for that purpose. So, I think there's a relate there's a marriage I, I, there of some kind. We need to change the name though, maybe from event to ag center. Well, see, the thing is, is <laughs> something. <laughs> that's that's the point. Is if it's an event center, and it meets the definition of whatever we come up with and it's only allowed in certain zones, then is there a further distinction to make that event center usable in certain agro-tourismo uh, factions to allow it to do more than an event center would normally? So that's, that's what I, well, I, I think, think that's finally what comes down. under the use, because right. uh, I guess the example I used was if you had a 40-acre parcel and you know, you're lined with either fruit trees or, or vineyards and, and you're event barn is sitting in the you know right in the middle of it and everything and it's so far from everything else you might under a use permit allow more uses for it but 
What, what I was thinking is, let's say you had that 40 acres and it was uh, a zoned ag reg, but there wasn't no farming going on, and you still had the event center right in the middle of it. Would you be able to have the controls of the event center usage different than if you had farming going on around it? Yeah. That's that's well, just I, a, I don't, just, I, and that that, a that question. I that, guess that's. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Comment yeah. would be: Are there any zone districts that should not be allowed? I mean, do we want an event or a community center in a residential zone? I'm thinking not, but. Um, I mean, I did to, to directly answer the question. Then, yeah. yeah, there probably are a couple where they shouldn't shouldn't be allowed. Mm, period. Yeah. Right. And and I think some of the things that the, the commission is grappling with are the same issues than when I've when staff has done research that you start looking at an, an event center type use in an agricultural zone district and they've a lot of these jurisdictions have come to the conclusion that you regulate commercial event center type uses in one way and then through another ordinance some of them have winery ordinances some of them have what you've alluded to as other types of agricultural ordinances that you specifically talk about events directly related that take place in the agricultural zone districts that there is still one important question that um, I would staff would like direction on and that is is it appropriate if there is no ag use to have an event center type use in a farm zone a residential ag zone or residential forestry question does the zoning allow for that now the zoning does allow for it under community centers. Under community centers, okay. Well, what was Gold, the, what was Gold Hill? Gold Hill was in a what? Do you want to answer that? An event center. Go ahead. I I believe it was an event center. Right. It's not really ag oriented. It, that is correct. Yeah. Yeah. There there is an ag cattle use on the property, but that was not the basis for the event center. Right. There's going to be some community centers going in larger subdivisions and stuff is that a different category or is that just smaller you mean if you if you put in like a community center in a, in a residential subdivision for the use of the residents that under the definition today would fall under community center it would fall under the definition of um, the community center definition which was proposed that it would be allowed in, in residential single-family because with a use permit because you need to look at it based on its merits. You would assume that something like that would not be available for large parties. It would not be available for things of that nature if it was in a subdivision to serve a subdivision. I guess the other issue is would it, you might limit it to just the people in the subdivision and not for outside people to come in. I mean, you could do either right. way. Yeah, and, and that would be why when we talked about the new definition of community centers, we left it in a very broad range of zone districts. <clears throat> However, everything is subject to a use permit with the exception of some of the commercial zone districts because of those exact issues that you alluded to with regard to if you're going to allow a specialty type little community center somewhere you, you may want to put some special regulations you can tailor it mm -hmm. you see I want to go back to like <clears throat> yeah we don't want to relitigate the uh, gold hill but uh, at any rate if we're you know, if somebody's got cattle or mandarins, and so uh, it comes before the Planning Commission, and we're faced with the question of whether their use qualifies for as agriculture or not. It seems like we're getting a little bit out of our realm if we're making that decision at the Planning Commission. And so, wouldn't, wouldn't the applicant have? Hmm? Wouldn't the applicant make that distinction? Well, the, the Planning applicant? Commission ultimately was saying, well, is this agriculturally related or not? Mm -hmm. And so uh, then I guess it's okay for us to make the judgment, but, uh, you know, I think in everybody's mind they may have a different answer. Maybe that's what we're all about. But And, and within the current ordinance, there is a provision that the agricultural commissioner is required to make a determination as to whether or not a use is agricultural based or not okay. uh, so so there is an opportunity for the agricultural commissioner to get involved and to determine that there is sufficient cattle for it to be considered an agricultural use there are sufficient mandarin trees on the property to be considered an agricultural use and what staff has done in the past is we have brought that recommendation from the Ag Commissioner forward to your commission for consideration. Well, I think that's I think that's appropriate. I don't have a problem with that. I think. Oh. 
Uh, yeah, I still am online. You know, in the agricultural zone, I, I think it's pretty clear to me that we need to have some kind of an agricultural nexus with an event center. Yeah. Okay, it's just a minute. Um, we're going to excuse Mr. Severson now. Thank you for your time. Oh, you don't have to say goodbye. Oh, yes, Sorry. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I have a meeting. Thank you. I still feel the same way even after listening to all of you that I think the use permit process will be the tool that we best adhere to. Thank you. Okay. Richard, you're back on. Well, yeah, I want to go back. Uh, another concern, and I know we've the, uh, the there's you know the what, what do you call them? There's been a determination about fuzziness in turn, did. or uh, <laughs> the lack of clarity in the existing wine ordinance. And uh, I know previously we said we needed to leave some decision making flexibility in the process. And so I'd be concerned if we get so refined in our definitions here that. We get to the point that uh, people can't even consider an event center on their property, and uh, we can we can make it so that nobody comes forward with any proposals, and I guess that solves all the problems. Right? Be out of a job. They would be out of a job. <laughs> At any rate, they, we did, there needs to be a balance there in terms of the criteria that we come up with that people are presented with, and I know I heard Larry use the word guidelines, and maybe guidelines are maybe a more appropriate than hard lines, red lines? Yeah. Anyone else commenting on? I agree with Larry that there should be an agricultural component to an agricultural event center. Just having a herd of cows on the same piece of property probably doesn't go far enough. You know, I mean, there needs to be something tied in related to agricultural either by education or by what's being served or or something that that ties it in and and benefits the agricultural component of the property which is why we're supposed to be allowing these things anyway is to sustain the property and and keep it in agricultural production and and I think that's why the one project wasn't supported by the Ag Commissioner is that it it really didn't tie the two together they had a piece of property that had cows and had some other, you know, agricultural components, but it had really nothing to do with what was going on on the property related to the the event center. Right. Well, and, well, since, okay, I, and and I guess for for me, it, it it keeps coming back that I hear we want to um, save the agricultural land and preserve it and use it for agriculture, and now. My personal feeling when it gets down to the five acres, it's it's below that, you know, 10 acres and more, you know, maybe. My, maybe. But when I hear us talking about the event center, it could be just like the issue of the Gold Hill where somebody comes in, sees an opportunity to do something different and make money at doing it. What would stop somebody from going out and buying one of the 20 acre parcels or 40 acre parcels and they can put any name on it but really their their total goal at the end of the day is to have you know a big event center there you know community center or whatever where they're putting on you know rock band shows or whatever you know well, all, all sorts of stuff and so I guess I just keep bringing it back to the agricultural okay. aspect of it is, is what do we institute that, you know, conserves the agriculture and, and I know on the winery side of it, it's pretty, pretty simple because if you have wine vineyards, you know, great vineyards and you have a winery and then you're doing events there usually the focus is pretty much on your wine and everything and there's a, a component in it there now when it gets to maybe the tree crops or livestock or whatever there's you know it's a little harder to make that nexus but um, I don't know just putting an event center 
and ag zoning, I mean, the more I think about it, I go back on my original comment when this came up. Why, why isn't it in a zoning like you have your commercial zoning and, and you have your resort zoning, you have your industrial zoning, you have these zonings, but if you looked at the, at the whole county, they're, they're sort of stuck in, in, in certain areas where they can serve the people, but it's not like in every residential neighborhood that you have commercial or industrial zoning. I mean, they pick pockets of, of areas, and I don't know, for maybe the event center that can do run 365 days a year, have any kind of event, and, and the only restriction is, is maybe the, the parking, you know, fields that they have, the number of cars or number of people they have, go with the size of the building and everything is controlled. I, I just think we need to look at completely different zoning. I mean, think, you know, on event centers. So if, if I'm just following you correctly, what we're, we're thinking is that um, there's event centers that will cater to any event, allowable in commercial zones, generally regulated by ordinance already. And we've got community centers that existing. we think of as existing, that we think of as nonprofits, uh, fundraisers, whatever for certain groups in certain areas. And then we have what we're thinking of as event centers on agricultural properties that the main question is, does a wedding at a mandarin farm constitute agro-tourism? And that's going to, I think, be the bottom question that we may have to try to answer here as how the staff can, can define how we regulate events and agritourism in these areas. Is that yes. anything well, clear? I think, on, I, I think when you talk about weddings, there's a lot of weddings that go on on uh, you know, private people that own private property that have family members or other friends that want to get married on their private property in the farm zone. In any zone. On the, in the farm zone on a beautiful farm. Do it right now. It happens probably every weekend in Placer County. And so at any rate, if uh, you know somebody that has a beautiful site mm -hmm. that they can uh, manage that in their farm, then why exclude them? Because the people that are getting married out there are there for the ambiance. Right. That, and, that's, uh, that's the question. And yes. so the farm ambiance. Does it have anything to do with that? Otherwise, well, it does because of the ambiance of the area and the location of the site and that kind of stuff. Well, my concern with that, Richard, is that uh, that it tends to be more of a for profit when it's at an event center than it is on somebody's individual residential property. And so if it is a for-profit event, they're having a wedding and they're charging it for the use of the facility, then that's completely different to me. And I understand that people have the option now to have the wedding events on their own personal property, but I think we really need to regulate it when it's a for-profit type of event. Well, yeah, I, I agree with the regulation, and I think with the use permit, anyway. there is regulation, but at any rate, if uh, you know, if uh, somebody sees a way to make profit, which happens now, there are some of these that we haven't discussed that actually uh, in uh, the forestry zone uh, do have such a use permit already that, uh, you know, why would uh, we base this on for-profit versus not-for-profit when, well, uh, you know, if somebody can make some money and it's because of the ambiance and because there's a use going on in the property that is agricultural, you know, I just have difficulty saying no to that. Profit's not a dirty word. No, but it's uh, the intent to create profit is not the same as a community center servicing the community. That's not the same thing. So that's why I see it as different. Well, Mr. Chair, would center, let me let me say that a community center currently right now if, you know, I mean, like you say, a lot of these buildings are kind of run down and maybe they don't have the ambiance anymore, but mm -hmm. they have the ability to have weddings. Yeah. Okay. So there's right. really but they're not, not doing it for money. 
Well, they they're are. doing it to cover their expenses, but they're not making a profit to some, going in somebody's pocket. Know. So I don't think that that's the same case myself. Well, right? yeah, well, so it's this difference between profit and non-profit. Correct, and that's and, what uh, we're regulating. And I'm saying that what that's... What you're allowed on your property to make money. That's basically what we're talking about here. All agritourism comes back to making money for the farmers. So we're basically sitting here deciding on how to do that. And so I, I, so I don't see a problem with that is what I'm saying. I don't have a problem with somebody making profit. No, neither do I. But we need to set guidelines on how to do it. So that they're making the money doesn't interfere with their neighbor's ability to enjoy their property as well. That's the fine line and distinction I think all of us are sitting here trying to figure out. Yeah. But I'm what sorry, I, I, what I might uh, suggest, uh, I've heard five or six different definitions, and what I would suggest is that staff go back and try to refine your discussion to come back with some additional language for you to consider. Uh, I, I think if we had some language up on the board and we broke it down into multiple definitions, it might better uh, facilitate uh, a direction for the commission. To I go. think we're we're overlapping. I'm saying something that he's saying in a different way, and and vice versa in some respects. Well, I think a little clarification would help in some respects. And and I think, too, when we're talking about this event center, and then somebody that is uh, using agricultural property and farming it, whether it's wine, cattle, whatever, that they still have the right to get you know, the, the use permit to, to have the wedding or whatever. Maybe, right, maybe right. that's something where you look at right. it. Right. Event well, permit. I, 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 think, I, th I think what we're talking about is where all of a sudden it's, I hate to beat up on wineries because <laughs> they're the easiest ones out there to, because they have the facility set up for it, but where all of a sudden it's yeah, you know day. it's a winery and then they're they're having you know three day. three or four weddings a weekend you know one in the morning one in the afternoon and stuff and then the mandarin farmer comes in and he gets the same thing and so pretty soon it's not really tied to the wine events it's 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 a glorified wedding chapel and i and that's what I'm, I'm going back to. There's a way to do it and, and probably control it, or at least where they have it. I mean, I guess I keep going back to the focus. We're talking about agricultural property, and we, we need to figure out what's it take to preserve it as agriculture, but within a reasonable amount of use where they can get the extra income but it's tied back to the agriculture where pretty because I mean otherwise you might as well just take it out of ag zoning and, and rezone it to something else. Uh, I think one thing that we might want to discuss is I agree I agree with what Larry's comments and yours Ken that we really need to do this through a permit process I think that could have, give greater control to the individual situation uh, but I think uh, that could get become very uh, time consuming for the county as well as the applicants. And so I think what we could say yeah. is if you're going to have X amount of people, over X amount of people, then you have to apply for a permit for that event, whether that's 50 people or 25 people or 50 people. If you're going to have over that, then you have to, uh, have to apply for a permit. That's just a suggestion. Then they aren't coming in for every little, you know, I'm going to have 10 people here and I have to get a permit. You know, that's insane. Right. So, uh, well, there's a distinction too that should be made is on the permit is do you need a permit for the to have an event center? Do you have to come to us and get a permit to get an event center, right. or do you have to come to us for every event? No. Well, that's the question. Well, if you've got five acres and you want 150 people, I think you better come and ask us for it. Right. Well, I think I mean, my, there's my view is both that ways to they should have to come for each of, uh, event over X amount of people uh, because those are going to have broader impacts on the community and those need to be reviewed. I, mm -hmm. you, can, you have to control those because you can say, okay, you can have four events a year where you have over 100 people, not over you know, 150 or 100, uh, what, whatever. And then how are you going to know if they have four? You know, they may have 10, you know, you're, how do you control that? How do you book an event when you say, okay, I've got you signed up for June 25th, but first I have to go see if I can get a permit for it. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Well, a lot of times these weddings or whatever the events are are planned way, way, way ahead of time. And yeah, so but these permits don't time. happen overnight either. How long has the one winery been applying for his? Two years? Well, it, 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 should, be a, it should be a quicker <laughs> process. A for an individual obviously, meeting. Well, obviously, we can discuss that. But the idea is that we have different <laughs> permit reviews for Maybe. different things. So, George. If I could, there, is, there are some options that, that just so the commission is aware of it. If someone is having uh, uh, events like Commissioner Johnson has alluded to, we do have a temporary outdoor event permit that you're allowed to get two a year. And it's relatively quickly. You can do that relatively quickly. You can do that in about, we, we actually done them in a month or less. In a sense, we just make sure health, safety, welfare, adequate water, adequate sewage disposal, traffic controls, that sort of thing. So there is that option available for some of these just non-reoccurring type events. I so. think we're mostly concerned, as Jeffrey was pointing out, on the reoccurring events like weddings every other weekend or well, something like that. that that's going to need some definition. Well, there is. There is a, well, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot, but I'm just saying right. in relative, if we have new community center and event center definitions, mm -hmm. we're going to have to have some definitions on, you know, 40 acres, you can have 100 people without asking. Five acres, you got to come and ask. Things like that. I that's but I think a lot of them yeah. follow from what we define first as community center versus mm -hmm. event center and event centers regarding agritourism. It seems to follow that way. Maybe me. the deal is if they come back, if they come for a conditional use permit for the facility, part of that condition is the number of events based on size and what it can handle and location and that type of thing. Then they know yeah. they can have X so many All events in those parameters. and book them at their convenience, right. but their neighbor knows that there's not going to be any more than that. And, and, and then those limitations can be tailored to site-specific requests. Exactly, and a sunset law put in on every one of them so that if there's too many complaints within two years, you're out of there. Right. But anyway, as, as some direction for staff, hopefully... Right. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Please. Yeah, I think we've... Well, George, you raised your hand. Go ahead. <laughs> I think what I was going to say is going to be counter to what you just said. So. You're going to say counter? I think it might be counter. What I was going to say is I was going to ask the commission if we've gotten a lot of direction but if they would like to quickly run through these questions to see if there's any hot but button issues, you don't have to discuss them if you choose not to. Well, I think it's consistent with what I was going to say is, uh -huh. you know, maybe we need to, at least I have one suggestion that's beyond the 10,000 foot level. And that addresses uh, lighting and noise and uh -huh. all those types of things. And uh, one of the issues that's not in the report that's probably not a question, but addresses those, is in the past we have, uh, with the tennis court here in Auburn, where the uh, proponent was uh, proposing to have several events, and he had several neighbors, I mean, several tennis matches, and there were some restrictions on timing and that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. one of the things that the commission uh, added, I think, as a condition to that permit was that the proponent be responsible to uh, notify near end neighbors about, uh, you know, schedule of uh, matches or schedule of events so that, uh, as well as his, their telephone number so that uh, the, the person that's running the events has uh, taken a, an upfront uh, announcement to the neighbors so that they, that he can find out and they feel comfortable, give them a call if uh, there's problems that are occurring. And that would be maybe one thing, even the enforcement part, that would address. So that would be an opportunity for a standard condition. I don't have the exact wording, but a standard condition in these type right. of permits. So the pre-notification kind of yeah. thing. That would be an easy, that would be an easy standard for us yeah, to, to, to propose as right. part of something that we brought back. It goes along with notification on distances, too, because right. a lot of this stuff, 300 feet, is nothing. Uh -huh. You know, a mile would be, you know, 20 people maybe saw on some of them. But, mm -hmm. yeah, along with what Richard was saying, yeah. But yeah, also, um, I know that I'm okay with zipping through some more questions. You want to go through them? Yeah. yeah. All right. I got 10 or so. So, should there be a minimum parcel size for event centers in agricultural zone districts? Next question. Yes. Next question. <laughs> That's a yes. No, no, no. The next question. You didn't read it. Oh, I'm sorry. How does fragmentation of the county's agricultural lands interact with event centers? I think that's essentially what you've been talking about. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Should community centers and event centers be required to meet larger setbacks to create buffer zones to adjoining properties? Sounds like an individual selection kind of a permit thing. Yep. Okay. 
I'm, I'm sorry. Did okay. Okay. Yes. I think back on that though, uh, we're going to have to have some advice. You know, that has to be thought through as far as the setbacks. But it seems like that's a good idea. To me. Uh, essentially, if you think it's a good idea, we'd be happy to bring bring back um, some proposed buffers with reasons why those buffers should or should not be in place. Okay. That, that sort of thing. We'll we'll bring you supporting evidence of why it's a good or bad idea. Okay. Okay. So there be a limit on the amount of attendees at a community center or event center. We've already discussed that. Yes. Should attendance be controlled by parcel size? Already discussed some of that. Is there an attendance number that can be allowed um, by a matter of right? Which is, I think, what Commissioner Nader was alluding to when he said, maybe we should have a standard that says you can have up to 50 or 100, and once you get to that point, then you need to come in and get a conditional use permit or some other type of permit to allow you to move forward in that direction. Yeah. And that is pretty consistent with what other jurisdictions have taken an approach to. And, and staff realizes that would also be predicated upon the parcel size. A right. smaller parcel size may restrict the number of attendees, while a larger parcel size may allow for uh, more. We, we, we will take a look at that. Should there be a limit on the amount of events that a community center or event center can hold? This goes back to what would be the appropriate amount. I think we've covered that, or at least got to the point where we, we have need to have a discussion about it. Does the number of events allowed depend uh, on the location zoning of the parcel size? Already dis gone over that. Should there be limits on the hours of operation for community centers and event centers? Yes. Yes. Should the proximity to other residents limit the hours of operation? Yeah. It would be a sliding scale, so to speak. Yeah, I think it's, that would be something that would be obvious. Something that would be part of the conditional use process where, mm -hmm. it, you know, staff would be reviewing that and, uh, you know, it could be a condition in the permit if right. there's a question that would go before the commission for approval. Yeah, the overarching thing I'm hearing, though, is that you definitely want to investigate looking at that. You may not right. impose it, but you'd like to look at it. Should there be special consideration given to controlling noise emanating from community centers and event centers? I think the answer is yes. Should music amplifier not be restricted to indoors? Sounds like a for, to be determined. For decision, yeah. kind of. You know, I'd have reservation right. against that myself mm -hmm. because I think, you know, most of it's the music that's an issue. You know, the, the wedding itself uh, is not, or some other activity that's outside may be okay. So mm -hmm. it might may have to be broken down or considered maybe was a guideline. Well, it goes it goes directly to the next question. Should event centers be held to a different higher noise standard? In other words, if you wanted to have outdoor events, let's say, and you wanted to have music with regard to those events, should we hold them to a higher noise standard? In other words, if you had 20, 40 acres, should we, should we have a different noise standard that reduces the amount of noise at the adjoining property, property lines? That would also be a possibility of how to address the indoor-outdoor issue. My concern about the noise issue is mm -hmm. topography makes a big difference on how far that carries. You know, whether, uh, for example, I lived off of Dry Creek Road at uh -huh. Black Oak, and it's kind of a bowl in there, and there was an unpermitted wedding uh, event center going on down at the bottom of that bowl. Well, guess what? That old bowl had that noise going right up, radiating all the way up the hill. And so it was going probably a, a good half a mile up. And so uh, that's, you know, I, I don't know how you give guidelines that deal with that specific issue other than, you know, you have to take into some consideration how far that noise well, is. Well, aren't the carry. standards uh, approximately re the property line, if 65 decibels is going across the property line, wherever it is and so, whatever's causing it. Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's, during the day it's 70, okay. a maximum one-time noise level, yeah. 65 during the nighttime. And then, then our noise ordinance actually averages out over an hour that if you exceed 55 during the day of actual decibels, it's a weighted system mm -hmm. going across the property line, you're exceeding our noise ordinance, and 45 over the course of an hour during the day. Is there a list of exemptions mm -hmm. that go with that also? There are some exemptions that go along with that. Some of them are gunfire, for example, hunting, tend to be noisy things. So there is a list of exemption, exemptions that go along with that. As, as the commission is aware, noise is probably going to be the biggest challenge uh, that the county has to deal with. Traffic maybe? Uh, because I, I had an instance yeah. where I was out at Ms. Lewis's house and there was noise from an adjoining uh, winery. The challenge was 
I don't think it exceeded county code. However, it was audible. And how do we address that quality of life for residents? I, I don't think there was a violation, yet it was audible. And, and that's something staff's looking at and trying to assess how best to address that issue. Right. And, and I can agree with that because I, I have um, my property in, in Lincoln. There's a house that's probably 1,200 feet away. And for whatever reason, there's a house that's actually closer that if they have a party and their kids are out, and it's not that they're making excessive noise because if I drive out of the driveway and, and go down the road, I could stop, turn the vehicle off, and listen, and I can't hear them. But it's it's that it's bull effect the where they're they're up above, and it just, for whatever reasons at certain times of the year, the the noise comes down, and and they can be talking in a normal tone like this, and I can hear every word they're saying. I mean, I I hear things I don't want to hear. Right. I don't want to know. Right. You know. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, so I so I understand on the noise. It is it is a tough one because you might you might live in an area to where there's a there's a house that's can be a half a mile away and somebody can be out there talking and you can hear it perfect. Well, well, maybe I, they're hearing you too. So but I don't there know. there are some solutions that we might be able to propose that um, are a little non-standard. We have processes called zoning clearance in some instances. If you wanted to allow a certain amount of events at a certain size, but you were concerned about noise, one of the requirements could be that they, they provide for review to our department a noise study that looks at that and you'd have guidelines. So there's some, there are some, some different ways to, to go about this. We just need to bring them all for your review and let you kind of Say, I mm, like that, don't like that, like this, don't like that. Well, I, I think the, the noise is issue actually is, is related to the number of events, too. As right. someone mentioned they were got a noisy party, and that was had nothing to do with uh, any agriculture, any winery, any event center, anything. It was just a resident. I live in Roseville on residential property in the old part of town. About once every three or four months, there's a party about two, two blocks away or a block away. But it, it doesn't happen that often, and you know, and I have an occasional barking dog and this and that. But if it was consistent, or you know, more often than it is not. Plus, I'm only five blocks away from the railroad, so maybe that's why I'm a little less sensitive to the noise issue. But you know, I, it, it people do en enjoy themselves once in a while. But if and some of it was uh, Hispanic type music, what have you. But if it happened every, let's say, every Saturday night, I'd be definitely calling up our our code enforcement to, with their noise meter to go out there. and because I'm sure it was exceeding our noise ordinance, but you know, once in a while, it, it, so I think I think I think the noise because you aren't going to like, like you said that it doesn't you, you it's going to be hard to control and also sensitivity of a person. So the number of events is important too, and the size of the events, and in, in relationship to the size of the parcel. So they're all interrelated, I think. Right. Sure. And Richard, I know she said if it happened every Saturday night, you'd call code enforcement. I don't know if Roseville's code enforcement works on Saturdays. <laughs> they, we we do. We're but we're, we're not like it happens the, every Saturday night, and you call code enforcement. We're not talking to nobody. So. We're not we're not, we're not like the county. We do have somebody that answers the phone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Did I say that I'm like the county? Mm. I'm gonna Moving be, right I'm gonna, along. I'm going to be kicked off. This we'll move on to the next question now. I'm a fire department person. <laughs> um. Should event centers be required to ingress and egress from public rights of way? If access from private roadways, should there be special requirements? I think so. We'll beat up. Yeah. Just a second. Yes. Pro prob probably need to bring you back more on that. I get the sense that you're you're interested in, in looking at options with regard to that. I think uh, you know, it might be pretty limiting. I think it was Amador County that requires a, uh, some. A Amador and Santa Barbara. Counties. Have required some neighbor certification. If it well, what they do is they give you the, they give the property owner the ability to go out and talk to the neighbors on the private road mm -hmm. and try to work out a private agreement, whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be whatever they work out, as long as everyone signs off on the agreement that they're okay with this winery using it. Right. If that winery owner or ag event owner can't um, procure that type of agreement. Then they have the option of coming in and getting a conditional use permit or a minor use permit from us where we can look at what the appropriate standard would be mm -hmm. 
for that road to be improved, for that use to be there, and we can require that that be done. Again, this is one of the challenges that Placer has that other counties don't have. Amador County, El Dorado County requires access from public roadways because you can probably count the private roads on one hand throughout the entire county. Because of the fragmentation that has occurred here, Placer County has developed a network of private streets, private roads that other counties don't have. And as a result, you do have wineries, you have mandarin orchards, you have other ag uses that are on private roads that may not exist or, or uh, be available in other counties. Okay. Uh, uh, George, I think I mentioned to you the last time we were discussing this that I wanted to make sure that not only do we deal with specifying how the parking is going to be on that property for events, but that they cannot park on county roads or on public roads because that just creates an, an impediment to potentially right. emergency vehicles. I, I just think that needs to be laid out that they can't do that because otherwise you stop, you're going to you stop somebody from parking on a county road legally? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, you, yeah, yeah, I, I believe you can. It depends on certain requirements. If there's certain amounts of shoulder and improved shoulder, um, people can park or Department of Public Works can sign it for no parking if it's if it's a safety hazard. Should events centers and agricultural districts be required to be subordinate and in support of an on-site agricultural use? Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I think, think that's, want, that's that, that agricultural yes. no event center thing. Yeah. Okay. Now we just have to decide what the details about that. Yeah. Okay. What is the minimum acreage required for on-site agricultural use? I think we've alluded to that several we'll times. Bring we'll bring back more information with regard to, to, to acreage and, and uses. Should community centers and event centers be required to have on-site security if alcohol is served? That was a, that was a Lincoln Mac question. Uh, the only comment that I wrote on uh, notes on that was that maybe we uh, uh, say over a certain, if they're going to have, say, over, you know, 150 people or something on site that maybe a security would be appropriate just because of potential traffic control issues um, Just just a thought and it doesn't have to be 150. It could be higher or whatever mm -hmm. Just a thought Okay, well, this is what one area where you have to probably define on-site security is this uh, somebody that you hire that's certified to be a security person or put a hat and a badge on them or whatever. <laughs> so I think it, yeah. personally, I think that might become kind of an onerous requirement or something that maybe becomes. Well, when you say security, I mean it's not necessarily somebody. It's just somebody that's designated. If there's a problem, that can handle that problem. It doesn't have to be uniformed or whatever. It yeah, sounds like yeah. a detailed well, question. Can you make just, more details on that? Yeah. yeah. More details, okay. Um, should community centers and event centers have special lighting guidelines? Yes. Well, I like what Richard came up with. with the, uh, well, yeah, include. okay. Yeah. What would these lighting standards include? I mean, we already have a lot of guidelines. I think it's just simply picking the guidelines Much that we have and use. making sure they're specific. Right. Should community, uh, community centers and event centers have special guidelines for on-site food services? Just something we haven't touched on. And we'll move on. Okay. Should event centers and agricultural zone districts be required to be a minimum distance from each other? In other words, uh, agricultural event center one half mile from another one. You know, I, I looked at that, and if you say, well, we can't have them any closer than a quarter of a mile or a mile, but it's really dependent upon the parcel. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you have you know, Five, parcels. 40 acre parcels that have wineries on them and, yeah, you know, in the middle. It would be suitable for well, what centers well, Also, too. with something like that, it ends up being a race. Who gets there first? Well, it becomes discriminatory. That's what I mean. If possibly. you're there first, then you're discriminating against the next guy. Right. So, yeah. so you wouldn't that's want to be discriminatory on that. If somebody's got a suitable parcel, then they should be able to. Yeah, that, that's fine. And I, and I think based on all the other things that, that we'll eventually look at as a commission, that probably this requirement becomes not very important okay. as far as a distance requirement because they'll be much more appropriately um, placed. Like you said. Well, it's it going to be different based on the zoning. I mean, in a commercial area, mm -hmm. I think it's okay to have them a little closer to each other, mm -hmm. but certainly in an agricultural zoning, that may be an issue. Right. Uh, you know, 
Okay. Should community centers and event centers have special code enforcement provisions to enforce violations of their conditions of approval and the other applicable uh, zoning ordinance requirements? Can we be unanimous on that? Well, yes, Richard. Yeah, I think now it's uh, a little bit difficult in terms of uh, how the sheriff and the, and the CEDRA interact on that. So I thought there were several good suggestions in the staff report yeah. to address that. Yes. Yeah, on your page 13, uh -huh. I thought you came up with some good ideas. I agree with Richard. And and, uh, and I think the one thing, engaging the sheriff into this is, is I think, uh, if you can get that to happen, is probably uh -huh. a, a good way of uh, controlling this. And at least what they can do is verify the problem. Because otherwise, then it becomes from the property owner and the residents nearby saying this happened, and right. you're going to get two different stories. So at least the sheriff can identify what the issue was, and then the code enforcement people can actually go out and take care of the issue. So, and I like what Sonoma County did. Uh, that's just above your suggested things that we might consider, which is that they uh, to guarantee compliance with conditions of approval on the event center type usage, only uh, approving the uses for a two-year probationary so period. So it keeps a hammer over their head. Uh, and if they do have a certain amount of violations, then they lose their permit. And the county still does have its standard revocation process. So just because they may comply for the first two years, if something happens after, there is still an ability to bring that use permit back to the Planning Commission for consideration Actually, of revocation. If they set it up for two years, it would be required that they come back. And that's when the rest of the public right, can public make their complaints. And the sheriff could say, yeah, well, this complaint was right. onerous and this one was baloney. You know, that sounds right. I think that as we run into law enforcement having budgetary issues mm -hmm. and declining to respond to more and more what they consider minor non-urgent emergencies, right. the chance of getting adequate support from the sheriff's department to implement this is slim and none, to be honest. Um, and I think special code enforcement provisions without giving the codes more teeth is a goodwill gesture that means nothing. Um, there, there needs to be some way, and, and, and revoking the permit might be the best hammer to have. I think that's um, it. But if, if, you know, I mean, it's hard enough to, to, to get law enforcement to show up for a stolen vehicle or something like that and give it good attention, and we've got the best law enforcement around. I deal with lots of different jurisdictions. And Placer County shows up for more and responds better and gives more attention than any others I've dealt with. They don't have time and resources to run around for an hour with noise meters over a 50-acre piece of parcel and make notes and then come back and do reports for all that um, Well, there's bigger and better crimes going on in the county. Um, they don't have to be sworn people either. You know, they have a lot of people. They, a lot of people are doing this on volunteer too. You know, as far as if they're properly trained and they, they have the, the noise meter, meter at the property line, and, and right if you're going to just make a report, not we're not going to send somebody out to arrest somebody yeah. on but that. You, make it, you can easily it take a picture of somebody, their business and their permit. Right, but you so can easily take a challenge. picture of a bunch of people parked on the side of the road. And say, hey, here's a hundred cars. There's, right. you know, it's a, but there has to be something like you say here. Got to be some teeth. Too. Something that right. allows uh, <laughs> us to be able to say you didn't live up to what we said you had to do. And Mr. Rakuchi brought up an issue that staff is looking at, and that is how do how might we utilize volunteers? The sheriff's department uses them, and the police departments use them uh, sure. on a regular basis. Can that be a possibility so that a sworn officer doesn't have to go in out? Those those are things that we will look at and bring back to you. Right. Okay. Oh, that was the end of the question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Anybody here on the commission have any final comments to make? Otherwise, I'm going to close the meeting and thank all of the public for attending. Staff, of course, doing their wonderful job. This has been very helpful. Thank you very thank much. You. It's, you. it's important to have this type of dialogue and, and to it hear is. from the it public is. also. So thank you very much for this process. And thank, thank you.